It's Monday, and if you did not already see this story blow up on TikTok, girl, you about to see it now. So we are going to get into Tisa Risa's Who the F*** Did I Marry? I am the Just Case and Brand. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. This will be part one, and I will upload part two shortly. But take a listen and let me know what... All right, Who the F*** Did I Marry? Part two. So we both um, put on the table what it is that we wanted. We both had established we were dating for marriage. We were not dating just to date. We were not trying to be friends with benefits and none of that. Um, so the the dinner at Cheesecake Factory went really well. We laughed. We joked. We talked about people, which um, <laughs> is kind of up my alley, my sense of humor. It was just, it was a good vibe. So at the end of the date or excuse me at the end of dinner we sat in his car and he played this song for me by john legend i don't know the name of the song by the t well by the time this video posts i will put the name at the bottom i can't remember the song i just remember that john legend was talking about i think i met my wife tonight and i thought it was a sign so i was like oh my god so anyway we ended up sitting in the car talking just about life and experiences until about midnight so during this conversation he again is telling me how it was you know what it was like living in california how he went out there he went to san diego state he played football for san diego state um he talked about how you know life he loved it out there so he stayed um that's when he joined the company um and then he explained that he also did arena football, but only did it for about two or three years. He claims that while he was doing arena football, the team that he was on won a championship. But again, keep in mind, I don't know anything about arena football. So I was like, okay, I didn't know that they had championships. And he was like, you know, he got a little offended. Like, yeah, they got championships. And, you know, he was on that team. So he talked to me about how he worked at Apple. He worked um, something in the IT area of Apple, but it was in the store. Again, it was one of those. It's like when I tell people I used to work at Amazon. I, I really wasn't paying much attention to it. Why? So we talked about all that. We talked about, uh, we talked deeply into what happened with the ex-wife. It's because I had chips. And he was like, you know, he got a little offended. Like, yeah, they got championships. And, you know, he was on that team. So he talked to me about how he worked at Apple. He worked um, something in the IT area of Apple. But it was in the store. Again, it was one of those. It's like when I tell people I used to work at Amazon. I, I really wasn't paying much attention to it. Why? So... We talked about all that. We talked about, uh, we talked deeply into what happened with the ex-wife. It's because I asked. He was not volunteering all this information. So in other words, I, I get very uncomfortable when men start talking about their ex a lot. That's not what happened. I was asking questions because I was really trying to figure out, okay, is this a, are you ready for a relationship or are you still um, missing her? So we talked about that. We talked about my exes. That was a mistake I made because I talked about how I dated at one point in time, somebody I worked with that will come back later. Um, and he seemed real cool about it. He was like, you know, that was before me and blah, blah, blah. Um, so the conversation was good. Midnight comes and um, I go home. Yes, I went home. We ended up talking, talking, and talking. Mind you, our first date was March 7th. And within about two and a half weeks, Brian Kemp, our governor, shut Georgia down. We were about to, we were going to be on lockdown. So during those two and a half weeks, we talked every day. We went out again at Red Lobster. Um, I don't even, I remember Red Lobster. Um, but everything was going great. The issue was where are we going to quarantine so the question was are we going to quarantine at his place which he had like a studio type of situation like it clearly where he was staying um 
I was like, it's like a studio apartment, but he kept telling me like, this is temporary because I'm looking for a house. Like he showed me, he showed me the email from the, from a woman who worked at the company where she was out on maternity leave, but she was, she was putting him in contact <clears throat> with a realtor to help him find a town home or a single family house. So I was just like, okay, this is definitely temporary. Like he's not trying to stay here long term. And she was apologizing in the email. I'm so sorry. You know, this should have been taken care of before you got here, but it wasn't. Da, 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 da. I saw the email. I saw the email. I read it. I read the email. Um, so the decision was, are you, we're going to quarantine at the studio or are we going to quarantine in my house? First mistake I made. Well, there's a lot, but this was a mistake I made. So ladies, caution moment. During one of our dates, um, because keep in mind, in those two weeks, we were seeing each other quite a bit. Um, nothing physical or anything like that. Just two people who were, who I thought were really on some, all right, let's see if this is going, if this, if this is going to grow into something. He came to my house. When he came to my house, I had a three bedroom, two and a half bath townhome. He was in a studio. Now, I'm telling you guys all of this in in order of how it happened. So some, t some things I'm probably going to insert what I was thinking and the mistake I made. Can I turn this off? No. Okay, I still need that. Um, and I say that to say that I did not realize inviting him to my home um, probably made his eyes go, oh shit, she's a keeper. She got this three bedroom, two and a half bath townhouse and I'm in like a little studio. Yeah, let me, let me, let me go ahead and pursue this. What I need to do to quarantine here. The decision was made quarantine at my house. So we, the state went on lockdown. He came and stayed with me um, in my home. And for the most part, be, in the initial beginning it was fine it was it was fine the reason why I hesitate is because I grew up in the church so for me it was really like an internal struggle of bruh you always said you would never live with a guy unless he was your husband and now you live in what to do and he ain't your husband like it was it was a struggle for me because I knew better and I and don't come for me I'm just telling you the way I grew up, it was like that. It was not sitting right with me. But at the same time, I didn't want to quarantine by myself. I did not want to. So there we go. Um, so he moved in. We talked about the bills. Let me clear something up that I said in the other video where I said he paid all the bills. He paid all the household bills. He did not pay my car payment, my cell phone, or my car insurance. He paid the rent because my rent at the time was less than a thousand dollars. He paid the utility bills, and on, and so when he's telling me that he's a regional manager, I was like, "Wow, okay, so you got money." Um, <laughs> and so he paid he paid all the household bills. So my check really was just taking care of me, myself, and I. And I am not, this is where it's not going to make me look good, but it's the truth. It was intoxicating to not have to worry financially about how to pay the bills. It was a wonderful feeling. And so I kind of pushed to the side the fact that, yeah, you shacking up because it's like, but your page, you don't have to worry right now. Like he's, he's taking care of all of April's bills before April even comes because this was still March. So we're living together and I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, he's helping to cook and clean. And then we have a conversation about house. Is he still going to buy a house just for him or is he going to buy a house where it's for us? 
because we are going to try to make this thing work, be official, get married, have a family. So the question now on the table is, what are we going to do? Because I didn't want to stay in um, Riverdale, Georgia. I did not want to raise a family there. I refused to have a baby um, in Clayton County. So the decision was made. Let's start looking for a house for both of us. Remember, he was already looking for a house for him. But then he was like, you know what? We're together. I plan to marry you. Let's look for a, for a, a family home. For the two of us he was like this is how much I was approved for that's when he showed me the chase paperwork um, it was a letter stating that he and it had the chase emblem at the top he showed me a letter stating that he was approved for 700 and all right part three who the fuck did I marry so this is when he showed me a letter from chase with the chase logo at the top stating that he had been approved for a mortgage for excuse me for a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage or a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar house so he was like we can't go over 750 and i said i remember asking him can you afford the mortgage on a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar house because i know i can't this is when he explains to me I told you how I played arena football. I invested my money really well. So he said, I have money that will help pay for the mortgage. He was like, we're good. Like, I'm I financially, I am okay. Um, he was like, that's why I'm able to get approved for a $750,000 mortgage. So he told me that his money was in different savings accounts. He said he had an account with Chase Bank, he had an account with U.S. Bank, and he had an offshore account. This is what he told me. The offshore account, I was like, why? And he explained something about, oh, the U.S. <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. imposes taxes on money when you have a certain amount in, in U.S. banks. He was like, so everybody knows that it's smart to have some money in an offshore account y'all look I live paycheck to paycheck I again I was like okay that's whatever I said so you have the, so you have the money um, to pay for to pay for a home I'm also holding in my hand a letter from Chase saying that he was approved for 750,000 so I went off of what I saw so we contacted a realtor. I won't say his name, but man, if he ever, ever sees this TikTok, I owe this man such an apology. But we contacted a realtor in <clears throat> who was based in Cobb County because I was very adamant I wanted to move back to Marietta, Smyrna area um, in Cobb County, Georgia. He was fine with that. His whole attitude was... You know, you're going to be my wife, happy wife, happy life. So we met a realtor. I, I would find houses that I wanted to tour. Keep in mind that um, this was COVID. So at the time, we could not tour a home. It would, have to, it would have to be a virtual tour. So this particular realtor, we found a house in Douglasville, Georgia. Not Cobb County, but nevertheless, it's in Douglasville. I was fine with Douglasville. So we found a house in Douglasville, Georgia. The realtor did a, um, a, a uh, FaceTime tour of the house. The house was, it was really a nice, it was a nice home. Four, five bedrooms, four baths. So we did a FaceTime tour of the home. And the home was listed, I believe, roughly 400 and something thousand. I really like the house. I could see myself living there. I could see us living there. I could see us with the kid there. This is now April, just for timeline purposes. This is April. So he really liked the house. He was like, you know what? We'll put an offer in on the house. He was like, if you like it, because again, it was COVID, we weren't going to be able to see the house in person because the family still live there. So he said, um, I'll put an offer in. 
we'll see if it's accepted. I said, okay. So he puts an offer in. He's telling me he put an offer in. I need to clarify some things he told me and the things that I actually saw. So for this house in Douglasville, he told me he was putting an offer in. The realtor would call me because one thing that the realtor told us, he was like, if the woman likes the house, typically the house is going to get bought. So he kind of dealt with me a bit more than he did my ex-husband. Um, and again, this is April 2020. This is before we got married. So at the time, he was my boyfriend. So the realtor was calling me and was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I put the offer in. And what they're asking for um, is proof of funds. And I, and I know any, I don't, I did not know anything at this time about buying a house. So I was like, hey, you probably need to talk to him because I'm not even listed on the mortgage. Like from the paperwork I saw, it was only in his name. So he, um, he called him. I guess they talked. I was not there. Um, but I'm assuming that they had talked. So the boyfriend is coming, my ex is coming home saying, yeah, I talked to so-and-so. I sent him over the paperwork. The offer was approved and <clears throat> they are going to try to do a virtual closing. First, we got to do an inspection. If the inspection goes all well, then we have to do a virtual closing. He t also told me that he put down earnest money on the home. He put down, I believe, 5000 He said, I, I just transferred the money over to the realtor's uh, account or whatever um, so that it could be earnest money for the house. So I'm just like, okay, great. He was like, so realistically, this is April. We should be able to get in that house um, by June. Okay, no problem. So this is what he told me about three or four days later I get a phone call from the from the realtor and the realtor is like hey I'm just checking to see what you know what you guys want to do about that house so I was confused I'm at work um, and I said oh I, I was told that he put an offer in and the realtor was like he did I didn't know that he put an offer in and I said well why wouldn't you know like he told me he put the offer in and he um he had paid earnest money five thousand dollars earnest money and so the realtor was like well let me call him and find out what's going on with that because i didn't know anything about it so red flag of course so i call him and he's and he in true narcissistic nature he flips the script and he like goes off he's like cussing going off like he shouldn't excuse me I have the hiccups he shouldn't be calling you if he has a question he should call me because I'm the one that's on a mortgage he was like and now it's you know it's gonna be an issue and I said well did you put the offer in with him or not and he said no I did not put the offer in with him I put the offer in with a friend of mine who is a realtor so I can give him the business so I never I did not hear from that realtor again so I was just like is the house under contract or is it not he was like yes the house is under contract this is what this is how crazy things work out about three days later on realtor.com I'm looking at the house because I was trying to figure out in my mind how I'm gonna decorate it shows the house is under contract so showed my boyfriend my boyfriend's like I told you it was under contract he was like I, I like did you not believe me and I ain't had the heart to say hell no I didn't believe you <laughs> like it seemed too good to be true um but once I saw the house was under contract I absolutely believe that okay this it's under contract with him like yeah we're about to do inspection we are about to move um and so we had driven by the house keep in mind a family still living there so we had driven by the house 
at this point he was like I want us to start looking for furniture so that way we can go ahead and order it so when when it's time to move the furniture is ready because you know it's takes like six to eight weeks sometimes um, for furniture to be delivered if they don't have it in stock like he was he was very methodical and planning and saying this is what we need to do so we started going to home, home depot lowe's um because we had a printout of what the sellers were going to take they were going to take the appliances he had a printout let me be clear he had a printout so it said on there that they were going to take the appliances. So we needed to get a new stove, um, new refrigerator, new microwave, all that stuff. So we went to Home Depot and Lowe's and I I went ham. I chose all these new appliances and here's where we get into the shopping. All right, part four. So we go to Home Depot, we go to Lowe's, I'm choosing all these appliances. He's taking pictures of this of the um, the SKU number. We have representatives helping us, and he basically explains to them, "Hey, we're we're buying a house. Um, we should be closing sometime in June. Can we order this stuff now? Can I can I put a hold on it? Like, what can we do? Because <coughs> we're not ready for delivery." I stood there. As the Home Depot rep said, we can hold it in our warehouse. Like, you can buy something and we can hold it. People do it all the time, especially with COVID. So, I watched him pay. Um, I want to say it was about three or... It was either three fifty or 500 I watched him pay a deposit on a whole new set of appliances for them. And they were going to hold it until we were ready for delivery. I watched this so I was like okay good deal like we got the appliances next let's go to rooms to go and Ashley furniture and find um, actual furniture so we went all around rooms to go we went to Ashley furniture we went to American signature and I I, I saw all these things that I wanted again he's taking pictures of it he was like I can go online and order it I didn't think anything of it because again I just saw that we held the appliances so I was like okay that's that's fine um, so April turns into May May 2020 comes um, this is where things start to get a little interesting May comes and obviously we had not done inspection and I'm asking him all the time, what's, so what's the deal with the house? He was like, oh, because of COVID, they're trying to get someone to do the inspection. But the guy that they had, it was always something. The guy they had caught COVID, so they're going to have to get somebody else. And he's like, he's like 15 houses backed up, so it'll be a while. So at this point in May, I know I look crazy. In this point in May of 2020, I started recording um, audio diaries. I don't know why. I, it was some something just made me just start recording my thoughts in, a, in an audio diary, and I still have them. And I would I would save them by the date, and um, I would just start talking about what's on my mind. So I was like, I knew I knew there was something something was nagging me like mm. but I I kept pushing it out of my mind I was like you saw th this is what I reminded myself you saw him pay for the appliances you know the house is under contract you know that he told you that um, he's the one who put the house under contract why would like I remember saying to myself why would he lie about that this is so easy to verify why would he lie about that have you caught him in any other lie and at the time the answer was no um so I really was like 
maybe you just aren't used to a guy who actually does what he's supposed to do like i i was questioning myself and then answering my own questions so inspection didn't happen around mid-may i found out i was pregnant may 2020 when i found out i was pregnant he was ecstatic and i was like oh shit the reason why i was oh shit is because number one i'm plus size number two because of my age i was i, I felt like it was probably gonna be a high-risk pregnancy um and i wasn't married and that nagged i cannot tell y'all how much it nagged me there was a lot of internal <coughs> struggle in between my family didn't even know that he had moved in at this point i told them you know that i was pregnant um went to the doctor everything looked good um but again because it was covid he couldn't go in with me um into the actual room so you know doing any sort of ultrasound doing the blood test because my hcg levels were really high so the doctor was like hey it might be twins we don't know yet um you're still kind of early you know along um they gave me a due date the due date was january 26 of 2021 um so yeah uh may found out i was pregnant so there was now more of a push into we got to get a house we got to get the fuck up out of here i'm not having a baby in riverdale okay nothing against riverdale but i ain't having a baby in riverdale so we need we need to we need to find out what's going on with this house and so he was very he was on top of it he had an answer for everything um he was like you know i'm gonna call and find out what's going on blah 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 um he then magically told me about a week later oh they're going to do inspection on the on the house like in two days so i was just like okay keep in mind i'm i'm taking his word for it i'm taking his word for all this so he's like they're going to do an inspection um once we get the inspection report back then we will know what you know what we are going to be responsible for what what are we getting ourselves into so um <laughs> i guess they did an inspection he showed me an inspection report um the only thing that they said that the roof had just recently been replaced which he i remember he was very happy about um and the issues that they that there were for the house were minor it was not it was not a bad because we did have a discussion about it he was like it's not it's nothing that we can't handle then he said that we were set to close um the end of may we were set to close the end of may he told me it was going to be a virtual closing you're probably like what the hell is a virtual closing because again he's saying because of covid people are not closing in the office they're doing a virtual closing where um you would need to electronically sign the paperwork this is what he's telling me and so he was like we're set to close like just before memorial day and so for some reason again there's still that nagging part for some reason i didn't start packing I, anyone that knows me will tell you i hate moving i've done it enough in my life i hate moving but i did not start packing up that house at all i was just like you know i'm pregnant my body was changing so fast that it was like i can barely keep my eyes open half the day um and so no i didn't start packing and I remember I did record, again, I was recording audio diaries just about every day. When something didn't sit right, I would verbally record it in the audio diary because I was like, I don't know what it is, but there's something. That was the theme of our relationship. I don't know what it is, but I know there's something. Um, and so... I remember talking to myself in my little prayer closet because that's where I would do my recordings and I remember thinking 
what if he what if we don't get this house like what if we don't get what if he's lying but again there goes that thought process of why would he lie about this like who makes up that they're buying a house when in fact they're not and then he's showing you all this paperwork like come on you can't be that jaded that you don't even believe what's in front of you all right so now we're going to go into part five okay part five who the fuck did i marry so I'm questioning all this stuff in my head out loud on my audio diaries and then once again I'm like but look at what you well, look at what he's giving you like he's paying he, he, it wasn't a question about money it was just a question of are we really are we really about to move into this house and <clears throat> keep in mind he's paying all the household bills he still is so We were supposed to close before Memorial Day. We didn't. There was an excuse. There was always an excuse with him. Always an excuse. And I didn't know enough about the process to question stuff because I really wasn't involved the way I should have been. And it was giving me a lot of anxiety. So I'm pregnant with a lot of anxiety. Um, and if push, if I'm gonna be a hundred percent honest with y'all, I was not expecting that I was probably going to have a healthy pregnancy because I was stressed. And what I was stressed about is I didn't know what was going on because I wasn't really involved the way that a normal relationship would be involved. Just being honest. Um, so we did not close around we move now into june this is now going into june around june 5th i looked at the house again on realtor.com i don't know what made me do it other than and i don't mean to sound super spiritual i know that people are like you know you may or may not believe in god but i'm telling you i believe with all my heart probably the Holy Spirit was like look at that house on realtor.com so I looked at the house on realtor.com this was around June 5th it showed that the house was off the market and I remember being like okay wait what is what does that mean what what does that mean because ex-husband is telling me we're about to close on the house we're about to close it's our house we got furniture da 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 um, he's also telling me that he's been in contact with the realtor, his friend, who was telling him, you know, this is what was happening next. Here's what's going on. So the guy that we initially worked with apparently is completely out of the picture. But again, I was not heavily involved. So I'm just like, let me look at the house. I see it's off market. What the fuck does off market mean? Like now I'm really freaking out. So it shows the name of the real estate agent for the seller. I don't remember her name. I called her and I said, you know, my, <clears throat> I said, excuse me. I said, my husband and I, even though I wasn't married, my husband and I were looking at this house at one, two, three main street. And we really wanted to tour it, but now I'm showing it's off market. Is it not available? Or, you know, I, I pulled that card. And she was like, oh, no, ma'am. Um, the home closed yesterday. It closed June 4th. Again, there are certain dates I just remember. Um, and I said, oh, it closed June 4th? I was like, really? <laughs> um <clears throat> And she said, yes, ma'am. She was like, um, my, my sellers sold the house. And I was like, oh, man, okay. Well, I said, my husband and I really wanted, you know, we love the pictures of it. And we're getting ready to start a family. So I would have loved to have been able to, you know, have the opportunity to see it. I asked her something. I don't remember the specific question I asked her. 
And I don't even, I, I know why I asked the question because I was anticipating that my boyfriend at the time was going to have some sort of excuse. So I asked her something about the buyers. And I remember, I, and somehow, again, forgive me, I don't remember the question I asked her, but the answer was that it was an older white couple older white couple so I get off the phone with her I record an audio diary and in the audio diary I specifically say okay there is no house he's going to have to get out of this lie somehow because now I realize at the very least he was lying about um him being the one who was under contract I knew enough about that so I was like what um how was he going to get out of this again I'm list I've listened to the audio diary in 2024 I literally said in that audio diary how was he going to get out of this lie and I was trying to think of ways on how he's going to do it. And something said to me, because I say it on the audio diary, I said, um, he's going to say it's a bad deal. And he's going to say he wants to pull out. Y'all keep in mind, I am pregnant. So I had a decision to make. As ugly as this decision was, I made the decision, you're about to have a baby with this man. He's paying all the household bills. Let him get out of the lie. And that's what I did. I purposely made the decision that I knew he was going to come back. And I knew he was going to give me some bullshit on why he couldn't buy the house. Because he didn't know that I knew that house is already sold. The house is already sold. Um, and this is the part where I said, I'm going to be honest, even though it's going to make me look bad. Because most women in their right mind would have, would have been like, I'm out. And I didn't. I purposely made the decision that I knew he was going to come back. And I knew he was going to give me some bullshit on why he couldn't buy the house. Because he didn't know that I knew that house is already sold. The house is already sold. Um, and this is the part where I said, I'm going to be honest, even though it's going to make me look bad. Because most women in their right mind would have, would have been like, I'm out. And I didn't. So, um, sure enough, he came home. He didn't really say anything that day. The next day I asked him about the house and he said, my friend, the realtor, um, he was like, I'm talking to him because something's going on with the interest rate. And when he said that, I felt so much relief because I knew that I had been prepared for, he's gonna give you some bullshit. So when he said there's something with the interest rate, I said, you know what? If the int this is literally what I said, y'all. If the interest rate isn't good, then we shouldn't move there. We should probably let this house go. We should cancel whatever furniture we we ordered or you know appliances, and let's just look for another house. I said I would like to be moved before the end of the year. I said, I really don't want to be nine months pregnant moving into a house. I would like I would like to be done with this before then. And he was, he the way I said it was so calm. And he was like, okay. He was like, I'm going to call the friend, the realtor, and tell him I'm backing out of the house. And I'm going to see if I can get my earnest money back. And I remember looking at him, I was standing in the kitchen and I cocked my head to the side and I said, okay, get your earnest money back and let's find another house. And so that's how that first house fell through. So 
Um, fast forward, I'm looking, I keep looking at this to see how much time I have because you know they only give you 10 minutes. So this is part five, part six is coming up, but um, subsequently what ends up happening, the next week, which is mid-June, I was at work um, and I started cramping, started bleeding. Um, and at this point, my doctor, I had just had an ultrasound. So I went to work and I'm gonna see if I can get my earnest money back. And I remember looking at him, I was standing in the kitchen and I cocked my head to the side and I said, okay, get your earnest money back and let's find another house. And so that's how that first house fell through. So, um, fast forward, I'm looking, I keep looking at this to see how much time I have because you know they only give you 10 minutes. So this is part five, part six is coming up, but um, subsequently what ends up happening the next week, which is mid-June, I was at work um, and I started cramping, started bleeding. Um, and at this point, my doctor, I had just had an ultrasound earlier that day. So I went to work because the ultrasound was, was fine. I went to work and the cramping and the bleeding started and I started crying because I, I kind of knew what was going on. And um, my doctor had called me and told me that when they did the ultrasound, they did not see a heartbeat. So she was like, this pregnancy is not going to be viable. So I'm crying hysterical. And now we're going to get into part six. Okay, so this is part six of who the fuck did I marry? So where we left off. So obviously, um, my doctor had called and told me there was no heartbeat. The pregnancy was not viable at that point, And I was cramping and spotting at work. Went into my best friend's office and immediately started crying. She was like, what's going on? And I said, um, I told her what the doctor said. And she grabbed her keys, grabbed her purse and was like, let's go. I'm taking you home. On my way home, I called my boyfriend and told him what the doctor said and he was like I'll meet you at home so he was coming from Duluth went straight home um and so about 24 48 hours later I had a doctor's appointment and my doctor gave me three options first option let everything happen naturally your body will expel the fetus on its own second option you can take a pill which will induce expelling the fetus at home the pill basically will cause you to contract and expel the third option was to go into the hospital and do a dnc i did not want to do a dnc because i did not want to be in a hospital with covid going on um and for whatever reason i did not do the option of let it happen naturally so i chose to do the pill his birthday was um June 17th, my ex's boyfriend, excuse me, my ex's birthday was June 17th. So the decision was made. We're going to celebrate his birthday that day, go out to eat. Um, and then that night I would take the pill because we both were off from work the next two days, next two or three days. So um, went out to eat to try to celebrate as best we could and then took the pill that night that night was the most traumatic excruciating pain i've ever put my body through um i do not recommend any woman if prayerfully you don't have to go through that but i don't recommend taking that pill if you don't have to don't do it um i st i spent the whole night in the bathroom just crying in so much pain I couldn't take, they gave me a narcotic. I couldn't take it because it was, I found out I was allergic to it. So it was causing me to like projectile vomiting and it, it was a mess. So, um, and he was right there. You know, he was scared that he needed to take me to the ER. But in the morning, the pain kind of subsided. 
So about 72 hours later, I had another doctor's appointment where the purpose of this appointment was to do an ultrasound to see if everything had passed. Everything did not pass. So because of that, my doctor was like, we're gonna have to do a DNC. Um, my DNC was scheduled for the first week of July. My boyfriend, my ex, was going to take me. Um, that was always the plan. Two days before my procedure, he tells me, he comes home and tells me that he is up for a promotion. He's up to, he's up to be promoted to VP. Because of this, the president of the company, <coughs> excuse me, is coming in and it was gonna be this huge business meeting he had to go to. Um, the business meeting was scheduled for the day of my surgery. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm throwing a fit because I was like, you, you know, you, you, there's no way you can do that meeting. Like I need you to take me to the hospital and all this other stuff. And so he offered to have his sister take me to the hospital. Um, apparently his sister lived in Douglasville. I was like, no, because I've never met her. Like, I'm not, I know, I'm not having a stranger take me to the hospital. No, this is a private situation. I don't want to do that, blah, blah, blah. So my aunt was going to, had offered to take me. And then my friend who took me home from work had offered to take me. So at that point, um, we get into an argument because he's like, my sister is, you know, you you about your family, so why can't she step in? And I was like, nah, because I don't know her. Period. I don't know her. So, so my friend offers to take me to the hospital because I was all distressed that he's saying he has a business meeting and he can't take me. So I remember being on I seventy five on the connector on the phone with her crying because I, I was so embarrassed that he wasn't gonna be the one to take me and that I was needing to rely on someone else to take me to the hospital in order to get a DNC done. And she was really great. She was like, girl, this is why you have a village. Like, it's okay, things happen. The world is crazy right now. I will take you, you're gonna be okay. So he did not take me to the hospital um, for my DNC. My friend did. She could not stay because of COVID protocol. Um, so when they wheeled me into pre-op after I got checked in, I texted him and was just letting him know, hey, here's the update. I'm about to, you know, I'm in pre-op. They're going to get me prepared to go back um, to the surgical ward or whatever. And the response I got was from his new executive assistant named David. Now, when he told me he was up for the promotion, he did tell me that part of getting this new job would be that he would get an executive uh, executive assistant named David. And he did tell me, I'm gonna make sure that I inform David if you get a text from this number, meaning from me, um, pull me out of the meeting because, you know, she's my fiance's having um, a procedure done and I'm picking her up. So it's important that you come get me if it's something serious. So I text him. David responds. He said, yeah, Mr. Blah Blah told me that um, you are having a procedure done. If you need me to get him, I can go get him. He's in a meeting. Just let me know what you need. And I just said, no, don't bother him. I'm just giving an update that they're about to take me back. And David responds and says, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Please let me know if there's anything I can do. So I have the procedure. I wake up and I am now in recovery. I should be in recovery 45 minutes up to an hour and a half. I wake up. First thing I ask, and I remember asking, is where is so-and-so? The nurse who was so sweet, you know, she was like, everything went well. Um, you're doing great. She said, we spoke to your fiance. He's on his way. So 
I said, okay, you know, okay, I kind of dozed back out, but I could still hear everything that was going on. I just could not keep my eyes open to save my life. So I hear her talk to the other nurse. And that's when she said, yeah, um, Dr. So-and-so called her fiance and his executive assistant picked up. And the executive assistant said that he was in a business meeting and that, um, you know, you could relate to him what you need to say and he'll, you know, tell Mr. He'll tell the fiance. And my doctor was like, hell no, <laughs> HIPAA, um, I need to speak to him. So apparently my fiance called the doctor back about 30 minutes later and the doctor informed him she'll be ready to be discharged in about an hour. You know, you can make your way and come pick her up. He said he was on his way. He was on his way from Duluth to Atlanta, which is not a huge distance, but the time of day, one thing about Atlanta, there's always traffic. So he should have been there within the hour. I should have only been in recovery an hour and a half. Let's go to the next part. Part seven, who the fuck did I marry? So he should have, I should have been in recovery at Northside Hospital for about an, at most an hour and a half. Um, subsequently, I ended up being in recovery between three to three and a half hours. The nurses kept calling my ex asking, what's the status? Because they were actually getting ready to do a shift change. So they kept calling asking, what's the status? What's the status? Like, where are you? I want to say that they called a total of three times and they spoke to him twice. Um, so at this point, I knew that they were all like, where is her? Where's her fiance? Like, what is going on? Um, he said he was stuck in traffic, and so he was making his way there. He eventually did get to Northside Hospital, um, and they wheeled me down because, um, again, he couldn't come in um, just because of the protocols. So when I got in the car, um, and I'm in pain, but yet drugged up, couldn't keep my eyes open, couldn't really, I was just out of it. But I remember him calling my aunt and my mother and letting them know, I picked her up, we're on the way home, let me get her settled, and then um, I'll give you guys an update. I remember that. What I did not know was that he had texted my aunt and my mom and asked them to not bother me for like a week. Like, just please don't reach out to her. Let her just rest. I am from New Jersey. I am from an African-American family. You don't tell my black mama or my black aunt that, um, you know, please don't bother her for a week. <laughs> I didn't know this at the time, but I'm just interjecting that part. I'm trying to stay in the timeline, but um, he, he did apparently do that. And my aunt was like, why well, will fuck you up? Anyway, so go home. Um, he waits on me hand and foot. I recover. Um, just needed about 24 to 48 hours to just get my mind right. Um, during this time, in between the when the house in Douglasville fell, um, fell through, we had not talked about a house. So I guess it was about a week later after the DNC. He decides that, you know, do you want to start looking for a house again? Excuse me, I have the hiccups, y'all. Do you want to start looking for a house again? Because of what happened with the house in Douglasville, I felt like I was smarter this time to say, you know, I want to be involved in every aspect because I don't know what the fuck happened with that house in Douglasville. But what I do know is that he, he lied to me. I didn't think, I, I didn't know then what I know now. I just knew he lied about putting in, or excuse me, I knew he lied about being under contract. So um, I told him, I said, I don't want to work with your friend who I've never met, never talked to. I know that he has talked to him because he's talked to him in front of me. And I'm going to demonstrate 
on one of the videos how he used to do his phone calls. Don't worry, it's coming. So we found a new real estate agent, really nice guy. Um, his name was Scott. I am using his real name, really nice guy. Um, and we told him what the budget was and Scott was like, okay, when you guys are ready, we can start looking at houses. Try to look for houses that are empty because you can actually tour those. If it's a house where someone's already living in there, chances are it's going to, have to be a virtual tour because of COVID. So I found a house um, that I absolutely, in total, we must have looked at about 15 houses. Um, but I found a house in Smyrna that I absolutely loved. We toured the house. Everything about this house was perfect. The house was listed for 699000 It was a brand new construction build. The only issue was that the basement was not finished. And he wanted the basement to be his man cave. Um, again, I went with him to tour this house. So this was already feeling very different than the situation in Douglasville. Because we did not actually tour the Douglasville house. We only did a FaceTime um, virtual tour. This house in Smyrna, we toured. We toured this house more than once. Um, and it was it was gorgeous fucking gorgeous so we talked about it he said that he had the money um again the price was 6.99 he said he felt comfortable putting in an all cash offer if you remember on the videos before he told me he had money in his savings from when he played football so when he said an all cash offer even I knew you you got that kind of money like where you can cut a cashier's check for 699,000 and he told me he did. He had money in savings um from when he played football and he was very comfortable paying all cash for this home. So the real estate agent, Scott, sent over the paperwork. The paperwork was sent in both of our names. It was sent to my email. Um, that was another thing that I changed after Douglasville. Everything gets sent to me. And then I will be sure that he signs it. So he sent it to me. I looked over the offer. Um, we were asking, excuse me, we were going to put in an all cash full price offer with um, a request to have the basement finished. Also, we were requesting for the seller to give us an answer within 24 hours. Um, we were requesting a quick closing. Um, these are just some of the things I remember. I remember 24 hours, like I didn't want to wait on, y'all think about it. 24 hours, let us know if you're accepting the offer or not. And then also a quick closing because it was a, a new construction. So we didn't have to wait for the current tenant to move out. We didn't have to do that. So I watched in our bedroom as he pulled it up because it was a electronic document. He signed his name to the offer for $699,000 cash. He requested again, the seller let us know in 24 hours if they were accepting the offer. So we submitted the offer at around 6 p.m. We were requesting that by 6 p.m. the next day, they let us know if the offer was accepted or not. I watched him sign the offer. I sent the offer back to Scott from my email. All parties had signed. Scott texted us and said, I got it. I'm submitting it. I will let you know what they say. Let's go in to part seven. Sorry, let's go into part eight. Good grief, this is getting long. Okay, so I just wanna clear up some things that I realized um, is kind of creating some confusion. So just allow this video to serve as a stop sign. Let's clarify. First of all, the story, background. He was born in Philly, raised in Philly, and moved to Augusta. Um, 
story is that he moved to Augusta for high school. After high school, he went to college at San Diego State, enjoyed San Diego State, stayed in San Diego for quite a while, um, got married in out in California, had a house in California, played arena football out in California, but his family was back here in Augusta, Georgia. Um, he still had a lot of family up in Philly, but for the most part, he had a sister in Augusta, he had a sister in Douglasville, he had a brother in Baltimore, he had another brother in Philly, and he had, um, a brother in Nashville. So I just want to clarify that in terms of um, the demographics, not the demographics, but the geography. Born in Philly, came to Augusta for high school, went to San Diego State for college, played football, stayed in San Diego, excuse me, stayed at San Diego, got married out there, but still had quite a bit of family here in Augusta, excuse me, here in Georgia. Um, he also had a sister, I think I said, who lived in Douglasville. <sighs> I have physically met his aunt who lived in Augusta. I've met his brother who lives in Augusta. Um, I have spoken on FaceTime with a brother who lives in Baltimore. Um, and then I will demonstrate how he used to talk to the brother that lives in Philly that's coming up you haven't missed that in terms of the proposal you did not miss the story of the proposal I simply did want to share it because it was embarrassing basically he gave me three ring options we went to a jeweler at the mall of Georgia he had me pick out three rings I told him which one I liked the most because I knew it wasn't a, a romantic proposal at all. I knew which ring I liked the most. I told him which one. He, he basically said, when I'm ready, I'll give you the ring and I'll propose. Fast forward um, about, I guess it was summer because I was actually pregnant when the ring came we were sitting at the dinner table he took the ring box out of his pocket slammed it on the dinner table and I was like what is this he was like open it I opened it inside was the ring that I had wanted um, that I had chosen at the jeweler and he was like all right so this means that you're gonna be my wife I was pregnant Again, when I asked y'all to give me grace, it's because there are certain things that's just like, girl, what was you thinking? Trust me. There's no excuse. Um, so there was never a, will you marry me? It was more of a, we're living together. We're having a baby together. Um, we need to get married because... The backstory also was that his dad was a retired police officer, but at one point his father was a pastor. So he could quote the Bible like nobody's business, as we all know, so can Lucifer. But anyway, he could quote the Bible like no one's business. Um, and so that's how we ended up engaged. And I was wearing a ring. I was wearing, I will find a picture and I will try to post it, but I was wearing the ring. Um, don't worry. There's more to that story as well. So just want to clarify some things um, for the people who were like, wasn't it weird that he had a sister who um, lived close, but he's from Philly. So I just wanted to definitely bring clarity to what he told me um, was the backstory. Born in Philly came to Augusta for high school, went to California for foot, um, college, played football at San Diego State, played football in arena football, um, worked at Apple, and then joined the condiment company in California, who then transferred him back to Georgia. He was married in California, um, and he told me he got divorced in California. That is important as well. That will come up again later. Um, and so the ex-wife 
at this point in time, at the time that I'm telling you part seven, which is the last video I just posted, the ex-wife lived in California with her two kids, his two uh, stepkids. The two stepkids were 17 and 20 or 21, but they were that age group, that age group. And he was saying that he was very close with them. So he wanted to keep a tight relationship with them. Um, and he talked to them, if not every day, every other day. When I say, and I, I when I say this, I need y'all to understand. When I say that he talked to someone, it means that he he was on the phone in front of me, talking to the person. I hope that that, because I will touch back on this. He was on the phone in front of me talking to the person. So he talked to his siblings every day. He talked to his aunt almost every day. He talked to his family the way I talked to my family almost every day. Um, and again, I will demonstrate how he used to do the phone calls. I will also demonstrate how he used to do the work phone calls because he called me every single day from work. And he would talk to people while he was on the phone with me. And I could hear people in the background, but that's a whole nother part. So again, buckle your seats. I promise I'm reading your comments, I'm reading your questions, but I wanted to bring this video just to clarify some stuff. Hopefully this helps. And um, honestly, I hope I know people are fascinated by this, but more than anything, I hope that there's a woman watching this and she's saying to herself, okay, it's time for me to ask some questions. That's my hope. All right, part eight of who the fuck did I marry? So we submitted an offer on the house in Smyrna. I sent it over to Scott, our realtor, and next day comes, Scott asks if we can take a phone call. So he calls us and tells us that the offer was not accepted and the builder did not do a counter offer. We don't exactly know um, why. Um, we don't exactly know why he didn't accept it, but the bottom line is, is that we figured out later on that he didn't want to finish the basement. So the offer was not accepted. The house fell through. I was okay with that because, again, I knew he had put in an offer. So we continued looking at other houses. We found another house um, in Smyrna that he really liked. Um, I thought that it was way too big for just the two of us. Um, and so the price of this home was much higher than the 750000 that Chase had approved for the mortgage. So what he explained to me was that he was willing to do the $750,000 mortgage and he was also willing to put a significant amount of the money and savings on the house, which meant that he was now comfortable going from $750,000 up to about $900,000 again. His his whole explanation was, I have the money where I can put down a substantial down payment, bring down the price of the home, and then basically mortgage the rest of it. So that was now the plan. I was not comfortable with a home <laughs> over $900,000. Um, but again, keep in mind, I saw the Chase paperwork. So... I was like, I just feel more comfortable sticking at the 750,000 mark. That's what you were approved for. Let's go with that. By this point, this is now fall of 2020. Um, we have been talking about marriage. I had my ring. Um, he had made VP at the company. And again, he was calling me every day from work. Um, the, I need to kind of explain how the company was ran because when you think VP, you would think he would be in an office. It was a condiment company, so they actually were producing the condiments, and I'm not saying the name of the company on purpose, but they were producing the condiments 
um, in this particular plant location. So a lot of times he would simply tell me that he walked the floor um, checking in with his subordinates, basically. Now, how did he go to work? For the most part, at this point, he left before I woke up. However, pretty much he wore dress pants, um, kind of like a deep, a dark navy blue cargo pant. And he had a polo shirt with the company logo on it. What I saw a lot of times is that he would not wear the polo shirt to work. He would wear like a company t-shirt. He would wear rubber sole shoes and the um, navy blue cargo pants. I didn't think it was a uniform, but it definitely, it reminded me of what someone would wear when I worked at Amazon, if you're gonna be doing manual labor. He didn't go to work sloppy looking at all, but it definitely was not suit and tie. Nowhere near suit and tie. Um, it is fair to note that outside of work, he was a man who he loved to dress. He loved to wear the latest Jordans. He loved to collect watches. He collected a lot of Invicta watches. Um, he he loved to collect hats. He wore hats, baseball caps everywhere because he didn't like the shape of his head. Um, so in terms of how he dressed casually, the man, he could dress. Um, in terms of how he dressed for work, yeah, he didn't dress like a VP. But his excuse was, I'm constantly walking the production floor and I can't be in a suit and tie walking the production floor where they're creating the condiments that we're selling. So by this point, again, this is fall. We're still looking at houses. Um, we're still touring houses as much as we can because it is COVID. Um, we had found another house that we really liked and a house that I really truly wanted to put an offer in on. This was now going to be the second house that we put an offer on. He put in the the asking price, I believe, was about 700000 He put in under asking um, an offer for about 650000 I'm guessing, but I'll try to find the house and put it on this and put it on the story. Um, the reason that that house fell through. <sighs> We found out that the home was sitting on a septic tank. We found out that the septic tank had an issue and it would have taken about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to fix the septic tank. The sellers were not willing to fix the septic tank. Personally, I didn't really care for the house that much. I'm the one who was like, I don't really want it. So even though we put an offer in, we had 24 hours where we could uh, pull our offer back. And so we did. Once we found out, I believe it was in the disclosure. And if you're a realtor, please feel free to tell me if I'm using the wrong terminology. But I believe it was in the disclosure that they told us the septic tank needs to be replaced. That's when I was like, nah, I don't, I don't want that house. Um, so we pulled out. The house fell through. And so... I was fine with it because again, I was heavily involved. I saw him sign the offer. I knew every step of what was going on. Our real estate agent, Scott, was amazing, but you will see in, when I get to it where he made a mistake as a real estate agent. So house number two fell through. Um, we then moved on, saw a few more houses, and then we get to house number three. I'm going to pause talking about the houses because now I need to introduce what happened with the cars. Stay tuned. All right, part nine of who the fuck did I marry? So we're pausing on the house stuff. Let me tell you about the car. So when I met my ex-husband, I was driving a 2012 Nissan Rogue, um, fully loaded, it had quite a few miles on it, but it, it got me from A to B. It was, in a, it was in good condition, but I was upside down in the car. He was driving a 2018 Ford Taurus, um, super, uh, sport mode. I know he had a sport mode on the car and I love driving that car. Um, 
when he told me how he was a regional manager, he told me that one of the perks that came with the job was that he would be getting a company car. And so we spent time going to Range Rover of South Atlanta. Um, we spent time going to Jaguar. We spent time going to BMW. We spent time going to uh, Ford, which was on Mount Zion in Morrow, if you all are familiar with that area. He test drove a whole lot of cars. In the end, he decided on a BMW sedan. I was there when he test drove the car. I got in the car with him. I loved it. Um, and he explained to the salesperson, you know, I'm getting a company car. I need to get a printout of the full price of the car, tax tag and title. Because what my company is going to do is wire over the money for the car. The salesperson was like, okay, you know, apparently, apparently that happens a lot. So he gave him a printout with the tax tag and title for the car. Um, in front of me and the salesperson, he called the person in the finance department for his job. Obviously, I have no idea what this person's name is, but he called the person. He explained to them, this is the amount of money. He said the president of the company, so-and-so has authorized for him to get a car, not spending more than, I think, 90000 tax tag and title. The BMW came out to just under $90,000. Um, and so he, I remember this conversation so fucking vividly. So... He's, he's on the phone in front. I'm standing, I'm sitting down the salesperson sitting down at their desk and he's like, they, you know, they put me on hold. And so he's like, he, I guess the person comes back and he says, um, yeah, the, the price of the car is blah, blah, blah. He was like, give me a second and I can send you a picture of that printout that shows tax tag and title for the BMW. He gets off the phone he takes a picture of it. He sends it to whoever. He waits about 10 minutes. He calls the person back. He says, did you get it? Apparently the person did get it. But the person who can, who can actually physically do the wire transfer had gone home for the day. So what he says to um, the BMW salesperson, he's like, okay, we're gonna have to do this tomorrow because so-and-so went home for the day. I don't know who the salesperson is. I can only tell you from my viewpoint what I thought. I had no reason to think this was a lie. I really didn't. Because again, you got to keep, please keep in mind the circumstances that all of this is happening. We're inside the dealership. We're sitting at the desk of this person. He gave us the printout. He's on the phone, do, you know, doing business, basically saying, look, I need this is how much money the car is going to cost. He's taking a picture of it. He seemingly is texting someone saying this is how much, you know, this is proof of how much it is. Then he asked the BMW salesperson, I need your wire transfer information. The guy got up, rushed over to, I guess, their finance area to get the wire, the bank wire information. Because obviously you have to wire it a certain kind of way. Rushes back over gives it to my ex-husband. My ex-husband's like, okay, first thing in the morning, we will get this wired over and then, you know, I'll come and pick up the car. My fiance, me, will drive me up here to pick up the car. So we leave. He felt like, because at the time that this all happened, I was pregnant. So he felt like, look, we're about to have a baby. I don't want you driving that Nissan Rogue. I want to get you something up. I want to get you something more secure, something new. I really wanted a Kia. <laughs> I really wanted a Kia Telluride. Um, and he was like, well, let's, let's look at the warranty. This man knew a lot about cars. He knew a lot about the warranty. He knew a lot about the depreciation value. And so he did talk to me a lot about what will we get the most for our money. Um, we test drove, when I say we, I, I test drove a Kia Telluride, a Kia Sorento. He didn't like either of those. He had me test drive a Ford Explorer. He didn't really care for that. 
then came time where he really wanted me to get a BMW. Um, he really wanted me to get a BMW X5. So he took me to B Global BMW Imports, which if you know anything about Atlanta, it's off of Cobb Parkway, but you can see it off of set, uh, off the highway. I believe 285 is where you can see the Global Imports BMW dealership. He took me there. He had me test drive an X5 and X6. Um, he also had me test drive a, uh, I think I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, a 525, which was a sedan. I did not like that. I wanted an SUV. Um, I loved driving the BMW. He also had me drive an M series, test drive an M series. So he was very adamant that I should get a BMW. The reason being is because according to him, he had a BMW in California when he lived in San Diego. He had a BMW that he loved. It was a white BMW. He showed me pictures of the BMW. So he showed me pictures of this white BMW that he had. And unfortunately, the car got totaled about two months before he moved to Georgia. So he had received um, money, not a lot, but of some money to get another car. And he used it to get the Ford Taurus because he was like, I just need a car that's going to get me from A to B until I get into a house and I'm much more settled. For him, he was like, I'm really giving myself 60 days to get settled here in Georgia after moving from California. But then he met me. Again, that's the story. So he had me test drive the BMW. So much so, I loved the BMW, loved it. I wanted a dark blue BMW with cognac interior. I wanted an X5 and I wanted an M series. So I can clearly tell y'all that's exactly the car I wanted. We were online looking for that particular car because not every dealership had it. I was okay with a black BMW if needed. Um, but I really wanted dark blue and I really wanted that cognac colored interior. So he felt like I want you to still, I want you to consider all of a sudden an Audi Q8. Let's just see how you like it. If you don't really like it, then we will go back to the BMW. I cannot tell you why he switched up. I can't. Um, but I can tell you he took me to an Audi dealership on Peachtree Industrial. He test drove an Audi and I test drove an Audi Q8. Um, I loved the Q8. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But I was tired of test driving cars. By this point, I had test driven test driven so many cars um our weekends were spent either looking at a house or test driving cars and i was picky i will admit that so he had me test drive the q8 i really liked it i finally just told him look i'm good with either the bmw or the audi because i'm tired of, i'm tired of test driving cars he told my family he was buying me a new car because it, keep in mind he had well, not keep in mind. Let me let y'all know. He had met my family initially on Zoom because, again, we were locked down. He had met my family. Um, he also had met my family in person because at this point, it was like, look, if you're not showing any symptoms, maybe we can do family dinner. Um, and so we had. So he had met my family in person. And now we will go ahead and move towards part 10 of this series. Okay, part 10. Who the fuck did I marry? Okay, had to sneeze. All right, so at this point, I had test driven all these cars. Kia's, um, hell, he even had me test drive a Nissan Murano. But the main two were BMW and an Audi. He had told my grandfather he was getting me a car. He had told my aunt he was getting me a car that he was going to, he, he was like, she's going to be my wife. I want her to be in something secure. So my family was really like, wow, you know, uh, wow. You know, who knew that he had this kind of money? Um, and so I hated the fact that he did that because anytime he got around my family, here's another red flag to put in, in the United Nations of red flags. He would always talk about money and he would always brag. 
I never realized it in real time. I didn't realize it until I was out of the situation. He always bragged about the fact that he could fight, the fact that he had money, and the fact that he played football. Those are the three things he always bragged about. Back to the cars. So I told him, I was like, pick one between the BMW and the Audi because you said you're buying it. So pick one. So this man chose the Audi. So he takes me to the dealership. I wanted a white Q8. He does the, give me the printout of how much it's going to cost, tax, tag, and title to get this Q8. Gentleman who's helping us gives him the, the printout. He's saying he's going to pay this money for the car out of the savings account that's, that's offshore. That's the story. That's what he's saying. So he apparently is asking the guy, you know, is there a holding fee? Can I pay a holding fee to secure this car while I'm working to get the money transferred? Because obviously with COVID, it's going to take long for the banks to transfer the money. Side note, I need everyone to understand one of the reasons why he was able to get away with the stuff he got away with is because we were on lockdown. It's crazy because it's now 2024, but I don't know. Do we all remember how it seemed like a lot of stuff stopped in 2020? Now, keep in mind, that's not an excuse I'm making because shit still got done. But in terms of business as usual, business as usual just was not happening in 2020 at this time so when he's saying oh it's going to take a while for the bank to transfer the money the gentleman who was working at Audi did not even he didn't make a face he didn't he he didn't blink he was like I know it's going to take a while because of COVID so basically what ends up happening is we leave he has the printout he calls the bank or he calls his his um, financial advisor who does have a name the financial advisor's name is Eric I feel comfortable using certain people's names especially if we find out they didn't exist um, so he calls Eric he tells Eric in front of me in front of me hey I need to transfer $72,526 whatever the amount was because I'm buying a car for my fiance this is the bank account information. Do you need me to give it to you over the phone or do you need me to email it to you? Pause. I can't hear what the person's saying, but that's what he would do. Do you need me to give it to you over the phone or can I email it to you? Okay. Okay. All right. Give me a few minutes and I'll go ahead and email it to you. All right. Let me know. I'll call you back to let to find out if you received it. Okay. Hang up. So I'm hearing this because, again, I'm not paying attention to, did I hear anybody on the other phone? Did I hear anybody on the other end? So he, um, he proceeds to type up an email, type up something, telling him this is the information that we need. Um, I didn't think anything of it. He called me at work the next day to tell me that the money was sent to Audi, that he called Audi. And he confirmed with Audi that they received the money. What he told me is that the car is going to be um, delivered to the house. Y'all, we it's not that I lived in a hood, because I didn't. But I did not live in an area of Clayton County where you would have a brand new Audi delivered to your house. So I remember saying to him, I don't want that car, like, delivered to the house not yet because I need to put that car in the garage and my Nissan was I only had a one car garage so my Nissan was in the garage so he said okay well let me call them back and change the delivery date can you be home or can you t do a half day so he's asking me can you work a half day so that they can deliver the car and you and you will be home for it I said yes that's fine because again, it's COVID. I'm working from home anyway. Um, I only had to go in the office two days a week. So I, I'm at home the next day. He told me the car would be delivered between the hours of one and three. Hmm. 
obviously between one and three, nothing happened. So three o'clock, I called him. He's at work. He sends me the voicemail. He calls me back. I said, it's three o'clock. I didn't know one ever came with the car. Um, what's going on? And then I remember I was like, well, do I need to call Audi myself? Because I thought that you handled it. But if you didn't handle it, let me, do I need to call them? And so whenever I would suggest I will handle it, he would get very, very defensive. Red flag number 472. So he was like, no, I will call Audi. Don't do anything. I'll call Audi and find out what's going on. Okay. So I'm at home chilling, cooking dinner, normal night. He calls me back and says, yeah, the car was stuck on the truck in Spartanburg because apparently that's where their deliveries come from. So when he told me this, I was in the kitchen laughing because by this point, I will be honest and I told y'all I'll be honest even when it makes me look bad. I was guilty of, on one hand, I believed him and on the other hand, I was like, let me see what lie he come up with. Let me just see. Um, but keep in mind, my brain was really like not rationalizing, not comprehending how deep the lie was. I just thought that no one told him the car was going to be delivered and he made that up. I had no idea how deep the lie went. So he said, you know, the car's in Spartanburg. Um, it should be delivered this weekend. The weekend came, he had a whole other excuse. Um, I don't remember what the exact excuse was as to why the car was never delivered. I do remember we got into an argument and I was like, don't even worry about it. I'm gonna get a new car my damn self. I don't even need your help. Which is probably one of the worst things you can tell a narcissist because they love to be the hero, you know, they look, it's, it's all about them. But I was like, don't even worry about it. I'll get, when I, when I have the money to get a car myself, I'll do it. I don't want to hear anything else about a new car. I don't want to hear shit else about a car. Because at this point, I was spending way too much time trying to figure out, are we getting a car? Are we getting a house? Like, where what the fuck is going on always there was an excuse so when i told him i don't want to hear anything else about a car and i am not going to a dealership to test drive another car um that ended that whole discussion right there so this is what i'm this is where i'm going to interject what i believe was happening i believe that my ex-husband is the type of person he gets off uh you know nuts he gets off on you being excited about something that he knows you will never get. So I believe that he enjoyed going to car dealerships. He enjoyed um, watching me test drive a car and get excited about it, knowing I was not going to get it. It is the, it is the level of cruelty. And again, I'm telling y'all stuff, stuff that I found out way later on. It is the level of cruelty that I still cannot comprehend. So the whole issue about the BMW and the Audi, I think he just enjoyed seeing me get excited and then pull it away. Part 11 coming up. All right, part 11. So for this part, I'm just gonna give you some backstory on the family. Pause all the stuff about the house. Pause the stuff about the car. This is backstory on his family, my ex-husband's family. All right, follow me. My ex-husband's parents, mom and dad, are both deceased. Mom passed away from cancer. Um, dad passed away shortly after her. I'm not sure what he passed away from. So he has a number of siblings. He has two... With his parents, he has... Um, two siblings two brothers excuse me two brothers one is older lives in philly one is younger by two years lives in nashville he has two sisters one shante is older lives in douglasville with her husband and two kids a boy and a girl younger sister kim is the baby lives in augusta with her husband worked at i think he told me procter and gamble that was the story 
he had two half brothers that were through his dad one brother lived in baltimore the other brother lived in augusta the brother that lived in augusta i have physically met in person shook hands hugged all that the brother that lived in Baltimore, I have FaceTimed with, talked to him. The brother that lived in Philly, the older brother that he looked up to, I have never talked to him on the phone. I would always talk to him um, through my through my ex-husband. So the conversation would be like, hey, babe, uh, brother brother so-and-so said hey he didn't call him brother so-and-so we'll call him john john said hey hey john i would be in the bathroom doing my hair brushing my teeth hey john and he'd be like did you hear he said how you doing i was like i'm good how's he doing um because that's just me and so he would relay back and forth back and forth back and forth um he talked to john every day from starting around july after the grandmother passed away he would talk to john every morning we both would be getting ready for work and he would be on the phone with john they will be talking for 30 40 minutes talking about football talking about other siblings they would be talking about cars they talk i mean it was it was really like not a big deal they would talk about the brother in baltimore they would talk about the brother in augusta and then they would they would reminisce this is the conversations i could hear let me explain when i say i can hear a conversation what that means is i am physically standing near him or next to him where i could hear him with the phone up to his ear talking to someone because it wasn't me okay i may not hear the other person because the phone call may not be on speakerphone but what i hear is um for example i hear hey man what y'all doing oh for real y'all barbecuing this weekend what y'all making Oh, that's what's up. Nah, I think me and her are gonna stay in this weekend because you know these numbers is looking crazy with COVID. Yeah, she over here. She's just sitting right here. She watched the TV. Okay, hold on. John said, "Hey, hey, John, you heard her." Okay. All right, bro. I just wanted to check in on you. That's the type of conversation I'm explaining. Okay, so I hope that that gives a little more clarity about the type of conversations I'm hearing. So, um, I don't know why this light keeps going out. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's how he would talk to his siblings. The grandmother passed away. He called me around April or May <clears throat> and told me that his grandmother passed away. His grandmother um, on his dad's side had died suddenly from COVID she has symptoms she went to bed and did not wake up he was distraught he was crying he wasn't eating he was just sitting there um listening to music not watching tv just sad because he was like you know my grandmother was always my my support system so from what i saw it really bothered him I did not think anything of it. I'm one of those people. If you tell me somebody in your in your family passed away, I'm gonna believe you because I don't play about death. And I guess I expect other people don't either. Um, however, however, that is not the same for everyone else. But we'll get there. So, family. He talked to his. He had his uh, sister Shantae who lived in Douglasville. Um, like I said, she was married with two kids. Apparently she was a nurse. So when I had my miscarriage, that was a sister that he was like, my sister will take you to the hospital. Like that's what family does. Okay. Um, I had never met Shantae. I've been on the phone or excuse me. I've been around him when he was on the phone with Shantae. Never heard her part of the conversation. Um, but he would be talking to his sister that's what he said that's what it sounded like too um now what is interesting is that we lived 
maybe 35, 40 minutes away from Douglasville. So there were plenty of times that he had invited me to go with him to his sister's house. Okay, let me tell you how this would always work out. Total times he invited me was probably three times for different barbecues or whatnot. The first time he invited me, I was like, nah, I ain't going because again, COVID. And she's a nurse. Hell no. Um, the second time he was like, yeah, she invited us, but I don't think we should go because COVID. No. The third time we ag I agreed to go. I was like, absolutely. I'll go meet your sister. Like, that'd be great. Um, on our way to her house, to Douglasville, to go see the sister. Um, apparently he got a phone call. The phone was always like on vibrate, but he got a phone call and he told me that something came up. And so she's, she had to cancel the barbecue to get together, whatever. Um, and so I was just like, oh man, you know, okay, well, hopefully we can go another time. It was, it didn't happen close enough for me to have red flags, if that makes sense. Um, but at this point, as y'all probably are like, girl, you so blind. But again, I didn't think anything of it because it's like, okay, it, it fell through. We'll see, we'll reschedule. Um, and so we just went out to eat and then he talked to another brother the brother from Augusta that he would have on speakerphone. So it was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. I really didn't. Um, man. And the more I talk about it, the more I realize, like, I, I'm not a dumb person, but it just never dawned on me the things that you have to now investigate. Um, it just, it didn't dawn on me. But nevertheless, that is the backstory for his family, right? Grandmother passed away. Three weeks later, he called me and told me his uncle had passed away from COVID. The uncle had tested positive, had to go into the hospital, and he died. It was um, a bit of a red flag. It was a bit of a red flag. But like I said, I don't play about death. So... I was just like, wow, because of these two deaths, he became a stickler about COVID. And when I mean a stickler, wear your mask, wear gloves, hand sanitize, wash your hands. Like he was annoying about making sure neither one of us caught COVID. So now I'm gonna give you the backstory in regards to what I was told with the ex-wife. Okay, I know I look rough, but it's okay. It's okay. Anyway, so this is part 12 of who the fuck did I marry? So this is the backstory on what I was told for the ex-wife. This is important. Pay attention. <laughs> All right. This is 2020. So this is what I was told in 2020. I was told that he and his ex-wife used to be friends. Then they started dating and subsequently got married. They got married in California. Um, he had bought a house with the money that he made from arena football. They had apparently had gotten married on the downward of the arena football career. Um, had a nice house. He showed me a picture of the house, showed me pictures inside the house. Remember that? Showed me pictures inside the house. It was a really nice home in San Diego. And um, basically what happened was that he came home from work early one day and... Have the hiccup, sorry. Came home early from work one day and his wife was sleeping with another man. The man was in the house. He and the man get into it. Her son, who um, is about 17 years old in 2020... Um, she had two kids, a daughter and a son. The son apparently was on his way home from school when my ex-husband found his previous wife in bed with another man. So the story goes that he and the guy fought. He kicked the guy out. He kicked his ex-wife out, but told her the kids could stay. 
the kids are not biologically his. Those are his stepkids. Um, she was like, you must be kidding. Like, I'm not leaving my kids here. The kids are old enough to where um, they were like, we're, we don't want to go because you fucked up. We don't want to leave. So apparently she leaves. Um, the kids stay with him for a few weeks. And uh, then she gets her own place. The kids move out, move in with their mom. He um, he files for a divorce in California. He files for divorce in California and it was an ugly divorce. She was asking for spousal support, all kinds of stuff. And then it turned into, um, you know, I'll help you with the kids, not child support, but just I'll, I will give you some money for the kids because apparently he was very close to the kids and he wanted to keep a relationship with the kids. Their biological fathers, apparently there were two fathers, their biological fathers were not in the picture. So um, the divorce starts out contested and ugly, eventually becomes amicable. Eventually they become cordial with each other. So my ex-husband moved. This is all all before he ever met me. So I'm telling you the story of what I was told in 2020. So eventually, about two years later, is when his job approached him about an opportunity to transfer to Georgia. And so he took it. New beginning, fresh start. He has family in Georgia. He took it. He told me this story pretty much the second or third conversation we had. Um, so it was always from the beginning that she had cheated. He caught her and um, he had filed for divorce, but he was still close to the kids. They still had a great relationship. I've heard him. I've heard him on the phone with the kids, you know, just encouraging them helping them helping the 17 year old like with homework um the kids really apparently wanted to meet me and i was fine with that um he would apparently he would send them money you know if they needed something because he he loved the kids as if they were his own i'm telling you the story as i was told it in 2020 so Let's see, around April or May of 2020, he informs me that his ex-wife has moved to Georgia. Apparently, she's staying with her sister in Gwinnett County. So she has moved to Georgia. The two kids are now in Georgia. And so when he tells me all this, I'm like, so what was that supposed to mean? Now, I will say this. He never made it seem as if she wants him back. He never presented that. It was always, no, nah, you know, we're we're cool for the kids. We're cool for the kids. Um, but he he's never presented that she was trying to get him back. I feel like it's fair to her for me to say that. Um, and again, stay with me. It all comes out. But um, that was the backstory in regards to the ex-wife, that they got married in California, they divorced in California, and then she eventually moved to Georgia, to Gwinnett County, after he had transferred to Georgia for his job. Um, he did tell me that, you know, every now and then he'll get a text message from her. Um, he told me that he, you know, told her when I was pregnant. He felt like she needed to hear that from him instead of hearing it from the kids. Um, and we got into a bit of an argument about that. But, honey, in the big scheme of things, that... <sighs> anyway, so we got into an argument about that. I felt like the fuck, is, that's none of her business. Um, but that's the, the overall backstory of her. So, remember, because <laughs> there will be a quiz. But just remember, he... Um, met her in California, married her in California, divorced her in California. She moved to Georgia, to Gwinnett County after he moved to Georgia. Are we clear? Okay. Okay. Part 13 of who the fuck did I marry? Um, so I've kind of given you guys all the backstory. Let's just kind of recap real quick. So I told you how we met. 
met in March of 2020. Um, basically, Georgia got shut down. I keep saying shut down, got locked down. We decided to quarantine together. I know it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, I really liked him <laughs> and thought he liked me. So um, I told you guys how we met. Um, things moved at a rapid, rapid pace. Met in March. Moved in together pretty much beginning of end of March, beginning of April. Found out I was pregnant in May. Lost the baby in June. Had to have surgery in July. Started looking for houses. Um, started looking at cars. All this stuff happened literally between March and the end of, excuse me, in August is when I got my car. So, um, Got a car in August. He paid the down payment for that car, um, which I was shocked by. And no, it was not a BMW or an Audi. It was a Nissan Altima, but I loved that car at the time. So he paid the down payment for that car. He told me he would help me with the car payment. The biggest mistake that I made, and I'll explain why I say this. The biggest mistake I made was that I signed myself up for a car, a car note, where I knew I needed his help to pay the car note. I knew better. My mom has always taught me, do not ever put yourself in a position where you are financially dependent on a man. And all of that went out the window. And the reason why I say that was the biggest mistake is because when I have pulled back the layers of this whole monstrosity of life <laughs> that I lived for 2020 and 2021, it really does boil down to the fact that I truly ended up marrying him more out of fear than anything else. And I'll expound upon that later. But um, I got the car in August. And by this point, I was I was exhausted of looking at cars I was mad that I didn't get a BMW X5 dark blue with cognac interior. Um, and I was tired of looking at houses, getting my hopes up, looking at a house and picturing myself in the master bedroom, the kitchen, the island, you know, all that stuff. I'm a visual person and I was tired of giving my getting my hopes up. Um, so now we're going to segue into fall going into the holidays. <sighs> Here's what happened. In October, we looked at another house. This house was in Marietta. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, it was gorgeous. I want to say that the house was about $700,000. I really liked the house. I could see myself living there. I could see myself cooking there. Um, and so subsequently, my ex-husband put in an all-cash offer on that house. I watched him put an all-cash offer in on the house. Our real estate agent, Scott, called us about 24 hours later. And he said, um, the sellers love your offer. The offer was an all cash, full asking price offer. 700,000. Let that sink in for a moment. He said the sellers love the offer. They are asking that you do that you show proof of funds so that they can accept the offer. My ex-husband said, I will show proof of funds when they accept the offer. The seller said, great. We'll accept the offer when you show proof of funds. So basically, we got into a stand a standoff. Um, and if you're a real estate agent or you work in real in um, real estate, I would love to know your thoughts on this. I had asked people in my personal life, like, "Have you ever heard of this before?" And I've had plenty of people who said I side with the ex husband. I would not show my bank statements until they. Um, accepted the offer. And then I had other people who were like, I wouldn't accept an all cash offer unless I verify that the person can pay. 
So I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Okay. So our real estate agent called us and was like, guys, you know, the sellers are giving you two days to show proof of funds. I had the letter that he showed me from Chase. I sent that to Scott, but that was for a mortgage. The offer was for all cash. So he needed to show all that he needs to show proof of funds that he had the cash to pay $700,000. He didn't show it. He refused to budge on showing them um, proof of funds until they accepted the offer because he was afraid that they were going to create a bidding war. So what ended up happening was Scott called us and said, you know, I apologize because I didn't do my due diligence as a realtor. He said, before I ever started showing you guys a house, I should have um, collected your pre-approval letter and proof of funds. He said, so at this point, my broker has informed me that I cannot show you guys another house until you show at least us, meaning the um, real estate firm until you show us proof of funds. And so I'm just like, well, I'm telling my ex-husband, just show them the fucking proof of funds. Like, what's the problem? Um, and so it was a lot of, you know, I don't really, I find that this is really unprofessional because it's not our fault that you didn't do your job correctly. It, it got a little ugly and it got uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't understand why you don't show them proof of funds when you clearly just signed a document stating that you're putting an offer in at full asking price. This was the same thing that the realtor was saying. He was like, but you just signed an offer. So what's the problem? Like you want them to accept the offer and then you'll show everyone the proof of funds. And my ex-husband without missing a beat said, yes, so Scott did his best to work with the seller and say, look, accept the offer. He'll show you, he'll open the books. He'll show you the proof of funds. These sellers were like, no, that's not. And it wasn't so much the sellers. It was the seller's agent. Big respect to the seller's agent. Um, but the seller's agent was like, no, that's not how we're doing business. He needs to show those proof of funds before, my, before I advise my clients to accept his offer period. If he's not willing to do it, we'll go on to the next offer because they did have another offer on the table for, um, it was less than asking price, but, um, they were willing to accept that offer over the all cash offer because those people had basically shown proof. So subsequently the house fell through, we passed the two day deadline. They went with the other offer. Also, at this point, our real estate agent, Scott, and I do not blame him for this, pretty much cut all ties because what he, I believe, felt like was, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on and this is not how I do business. So until you guys are ready to show the proof of funds um, needed to buy a house, you need to get yourself another agent because we were already about 20 to 25 houses deep by this point. We had already put in two other offers, they fell through. And now here we are with this house. And once again, it fell through. Okay, so um, good news and bad news. Number one, this is part 14 of who the fuck did I marry? Bad news. This is going to be the last post for the night. And the reason why, good news, um, tomorrow's my birthday. So I'm just going to make this video, post it, and then I will pick back up probably Friday because honestly, I truly want um, to enjoy my birthday tomorrow. I just, I just want to enjoy my birthday. Um, all right. So y'all don't be upset. <laughs> just if anything watch parts one through 14 and then um we'll be ready for part 15 so the house fell through in october 2020 and what i told him was i said 
I don't want to look at another house. I don't want to talk about cars. I want to get through the holidays um, because it was going to be a holiday season where I could not celebrate my family because of COVID. So I said, I just want to get through the holidays. I want to get through the end of the year um, and we'll revisit stuff in January. I was very calm when I said it. No argument, nothing like that. Um, And he said he understood. I just... A lot of what fueled me staying in this situation really was the fact that, number one, I didn't want to be alone. Number two, I didn't want to look stupid um, by having the relationship end so quickly for everyone to be like, we told you something was up. Um, And number three, I was ready to get married. And that what ready to get married fueled a lot of stuff. Um, and again, I was still making my audio diaries. So listening back to it, I knew something was, was wrong. I admit that I knew something was wrong, but what I thought it was truthfully was like, why does it seem like there's always something like, why can't we just go ahead and get the house? Um, why is it always something? Why can't I just get the BMW? It still didn't dawn on me how deep the something went. And for the people who keep asking, um, I'm going in order of events. So yes, there will be a video where I explain how everything came out and what came out, what was true, what was not true. It's coming. I'm just getting all of this out in order. So I told him I didn't want to look at a house no more. Um, I didn't want to talk about houses. Do not mention the word Zillow. Do not mention the word the word uh, realtor. Nothing. Let me just get through the holidays. And for myself, the question was, what do you want to do? You want to stay with him? Or do you want to cut your losses? And the part that kept me constantly second guessing myself was, what if he's not lying? What if he's not lying? There's no, literally the conversation I had with myself was, there's no way he is lying about having money. You saw, you saw the paper from Chase. They don't just approve $750,000 for a mortgage for anybody. Um, You see, I've seen his checking account. You see how much money's in his available checking. Like you, you, I don't think he's lying. (laughs) I don't think he's lying about that. But what is it? Is it that he doesn't trust me? Like I second guess myself so much. Is it that he doesn't trust me? Is it that maybe he doesn't really want to get married? Like, what is it? Because... I know what I saw. I know what I heard. I know that he's having conversations about move the money from this account to that account. Um, I know he's paying my car note and all these bills. Like clearly this man is making money. I know that I saw the the promotional the letter from HR that states his new salary is two hundred and something thousand. Um and I remember thinking like, God, what, like, what am I missing? I'm missing something, but what is it? Because I know what I've seen. I've no, I know what I have touched. I have physically touched these, these papers. Like I know how to read. So what is it that I am missing? He's close to his family. He talks to them all the time. You know, he's just a regular guy that just likes to watch um, NFL football. He leaves me alone when I want to watch Georgia football. Um, You know, he's paying all he's paying the bills, groceries. I haven't had to worry financially since I've met him. And as a woman who had lived on her own, paying her own bills, my God, that is the most intoxicating feeling when you meet a guy who just takes your stress and your worry away financially. 
But the downside is he took away the stress and the worry financially away and instead brought a mental fuck job I've never in my life had experienced. And I could not put my finger on it. I couldn't really talk to anybody about it because I'm a big believer in what happens at home stays at home. So I didn't talk to my girlfriends about it. I didn't talk to my family about it. But I'm just, I, re- I just remember being like, what am I missing? What am I missing? Um, so we did not talk about houses. We did not look at cars. We didn't do any of that for November, December. And he came to me like around Thanksgiving. And he, what I thought was a very open, loving conversation. And in that conversation, he was like, okay, I know I have fucked up. I know that things are not feeling too strong right now. He was like, I want us to get married. I want I, I want a home. Um, I will show you whatever you need to see to put you at ease. Um, he was very um, like contrite. He was very just like, what what do what do I need to do to put your mind at ease so that you know I'm in this? And that I want this and that I love you and I want you to be my wife. Um, So I was like, show me your accounts. He showed me his checking. He showed me. He showed me one of his savings. He showed me a chase savings. Um, He did not show me the offshore. And he did not show me the U.S. bank. So he showed me those two accounts, checking and Chase Savings. So I knew that there was money. What I saw in those accounts, there was money. I told him, I was like, if we're going to buy a house, I want it to be through the mortgage on Chase. I don't want to deal with this proof of fund shit no more. I said, I do not want to look at another house until the beginning of the ne- of the new year. He said, okay. That is when we then had a conversation. So I guess I lied because we are going to have a part uh, 15 or 16 tonight. Um, But that is when we then had the discussion about marriage. And that is where religion came into play. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I'll give you all the other part tonight. Stand by. Okay. Okay. Part 15, who the fuck did I marry? So in December of 2020, around beginning of December, we had a conversation, kind of a come to Jesus heart to heart conversation. And both of us had grown up in the church. And the fact that we were, un, the fact that we were not married, but living together, the fact that almost had a baby together, um, bothered both of us, both of our families, my family and his family um were very adamant like okay y'all y'all either need to get married or y'all need to separate um and so i'm walking around with a ring on um which i'll post a picture of the ring because god there's so much to unpack but anyway walking around with the ring and so he said to me whatever i need to do to do my part to make this work I'm willing to do at the same time it wasn't that I did not trust him as much as it was I felt like I wasn't trusting myself because again like I said in the previous video I know what I saw I know what I read I know what I've heard um but fuck something was not sitting right with me And every time I would question it in my head, the other side of me was like, okay, you know, he ain't lying about the money because you saw it. So, you know, he ain't lying. Girl, are you that like I remember saying to myself, are you that jaded that you don't even know what it's like to have a decent man? 
yes, I really had the audacity to have that thought. So we agreed at the beginning of December, like we wanted to be together. I believe I loved him. I believed he loved me. So the decision was made that we were going to get married. It's still COVID. So we had to follow certain protocol. So we filed um, our marriage license in um, Fayette County, Georgia, because I, <laughs> you could not get an appointment in Clayton County to save your life. So we filed the marriage license in Fayette County. On our marriage license, it asked the number of um, previous marriages. He said one, I had zero. It asked for our social security numbers. He put his social security number down. I put my social security number down. I mentally wrote down his social security number and I did a background check. I did a background check after I had filed a marriage license. Yes, I know, but I did. The background check, um, nothing came back. It was, uh, it was, it was like no results found. Um, I did a criminal background check, nothing came back. So I thought one of two things, either I had the wrong social, meaning I wrote down the wrong social, or my paranoia was unfounded. There's nothing wrong with him because he has been always throughout the relationship a big stickler about law enforcement um, following the law because his dad was a retired police officer. So this is someone who has been... This is a guy who would check to make sure my tail lights were working, make sure my signals were working, make sure my oil was good, make sure I had enough gas in the car. So when the criminal history came back with no results, I was like, well, of course there isn't because the man probably hasn't had so much as a speeding ticket. So felt we uh, filed the marriage license and then we made an appointment to get married and waiting for the judge to come out of chambers so that she could marry us. And the reason why I'm pausing is because, my God, if I could go back and see that young woman sitting in that lobby. Wow. Wow. I know we can't go back in time, but damn, if I could go back in time, I would. I immediately, I didn't tell anyone I was getting married because I was afraid that we had tried before in September and something came up. So I didn't want to tell anyone. I didn't want to get anyone's hopes up. I didn't want to get my hopes up. Um, I know that's bad, but again, said I would be honest even if it's ugly um I told my mom my family that we got married told my friends they could not believe it like they my mother was um relieved but she had no idea about what was going on my aunt was more like really you married her my friend the one who took me to the hospital for the miscarriage was like I wish you would have told me, like, you deserve to have people there take pictures and celebrate and all this other stuff. Um, and she was like, you know, she's the type of friend, if you like it, I love it. You rock with them, I rock with them. The moment you don't, I don't either. So she was she was supportive. My other girlfriends were happy for me. They just they just hated that I had to get married during COVID because um, they were like, I, we would have loved to have, you know, thrown you a bridal shower and a bachelorette party and all of that. It just sucks that you couldn't experience that. So we got married on a Tuesday. Um, on the way home, stopped and got some wings, went home and I had to get ready to go to work the next day. And life. I got married January 5th. By January 31st, I knew I was in trouble. I still didn't know how deep, but I knew I was in trouble. 
So <laughs> to give you all a very, very, very candid idea, got married January 5th. The things that the normal things that married newlyweds do when we got married completely stopped. And that was not by me. You always hear men talk about, man, now that we're married, she don't. Um, in my case, it was the exact opposite. It was the exact opposite. So anyway, yeah, got married January 5th. The things that the normal things that married newlyweds do when we got married completely stopped. And that was not by me. You always hear men talk about, man, now that we're married, she don't. Um, in my case, it was the exact opposite. It was the exact opposite. So anyway, because <laughs> this is not a, a forum to be all R-rated or whatnot, but y'all get what I'm saying. So um, we got married January 5th. January 6th, I went to work. It was um, a lot of people congratulated me because it kind of word got out that I had gotten married. January 7th, um, I filed the paperwork to change my last name. And if you were following me, you can go back like 15, 16 videos. And I talk about how I had to change my name back <laughs> to my maiden name. But I changed my name within about three days of getting married. Um, my attitude was, this is the bed that I made. I'm going to do right by him. I'm going to do right by my marriage. Um, I took marriage seriously. And when I married him, I absolutely married him thinking I'm going to be with you for the next 40, 50 years. So we're going to have to figure this shit out. That was my mindset. I did not get married to turn around and be divorced in six months. But I got married January 5th, 2021. And by January 31st, I knew I was in serious trouble. So that is where we are. The next set of videos, the next set of all this will be, um, me talking about how things went downhill before it crashed and I found everything out. In the meantime, tomorrow is my birthday. So, happy birthday to me. The fuck did I marry? This is the interlude, basically. Um, I'm not recapping on this video. I'm just kind of answering some stuff that has been written to me. Someone was like, why are you airing your business out on social media? <sighs> it's a valid question. Um, for me personally, I feel like this was traumatic to experience, to live through. Um, and I'll and I'll expound on that on another video the aftermath of the toll that this took. Um, honestly, <laughs> and it, I know some people are going to be like, that sounds crazy. It is kind of cathartic to get this out because I cannot tell you how much of this has been internalized um, since 2020. Also, I don't want to seem like a cautionary tale, to other women or to men for that matter but to my sisters to my ladies white black hispanic asian doesn't matter if something does not sit right with you investigate it um i cannot stress that enough if just one woman watches these videos and she's like you know what some don't sit right with me let me look into this um, then it was worth it. Yes, it is a Lifetime movie. Yes, it is Netflix. Yes, it is crazy. Yes, it is hilarious also. Um, 
And I understand all of those reactions. As someone who lived it, um, it was traumatic. But I feel like, God, it feels good to finally admit um, what the fuck I went through. And again, by the time this is uh, uploaded, I'm only to January of 2021, right after getting married. So when I think back on it, there's things that I'm very, very grateful for. Um, There are things that I'm just like, why? Why did you not pay attention? Why did you not question? Um, And the sad part is, I can't even begin to tell you. I don't remember the woman I was before I met that man. I don't remember. Um, Because going through something like that, it changes you. And I've seen some women in the comments who were like, I was married to a habitual liar. I was married to a pathological liar. My baby daddy's a a pathological liar. And my heart goes out to them because until you have dealt with someone so depraved, you, you really don't quite know how bad it can get. Um, So I'm fully aware that this was a risk putting this out on social media, telling my story, my truth, and really kind of being like, look, this is this is what I went through. I made dumb decisions. I overlooked things I should not have overlooked. I argued away things I should not have argued away. Um, I can pinpoint exactly the moment I should have left. I still feel like God is sitting on the throne and he's like, I never planned for your monkey ass to marry him. I never even planned for you to go out and date with him. That's why I blew your tire. But you hard headed and you went anyway. And then I tried to go ahead and show you signs. You ignored them. Like, I feel like God did everything to help me as his child be like, this is not who I created to be your your helpmate. And I was like, God, you taking too long. I want to get married. You taking too long. I want to have a family. You taking too long. And these are the consequences that I am paying for basically telling God you took too long. And um, I feel like God's grace is sufficient. It is. But at the same time, and I'm not perfect, I mean not perfect at all. None of us are. But I do feel like when I sit back and I replay the events that happen, I truly cannot believe that was my story. Because all I wanted was to meet a guy for him to be my best friend, for us to get married, have a family. I wanted someone I could make fun of his big old forehead and he make fun of my nappy head and all my wigs. And yet he was my ride or die. Um, I wanted someone that I could be like, man, help me with these kids. And he helped me with the kids. We had a nice home. We were comfortable. That is what I wanted. And I've said this before. And I say it again, I truly thought, I truly hoped it was my turn. You see the women who are, you know, so happy and, um, you know, they're in these loving marriages and life just looks good. I really, really wanted it to be my turn. And so... I excused away a lot of stuff that I hope the next woman who sees this does not excuse because I don't wish this on anybody. I don't wish this on anyone to feel the way I felt the moment I discovered 
the whole truth. Um, so I just wanted to say that because I think it's important to try to answer the why is she posting this? Honestly, I was tired of holding it in. I was tired of holding it in. Um, and I hope it helps somebody. Okay. Let's all take a deep breath. <sighs> Let's all get some sleep. Um, if you don't have anything to do and you just want to wish me a happy birthday, wish me a happy birthday tomorrow, February 15th. Shout out to Team Aquarius. Good night, y'all. The fuck? Part 17, who the fuck did I marry? So for context and just to clarify some stuff going forward, I'm going to now call my ex-husband. I'm going to use the name that I call him in real life. Um, so that way it clears up the whole fiance, boyfriend, husband, ex-husband thing. So his name is Legion. Anyone that knows me will tell you that is what I call him. So Legion and I, when I left off at part uh, 16, um, or excuse me, part 15, Legion and I got married January 5th of 2021. For the first two weeks, things were fine. Um, we got into like a, a routine, basically. I would go to work, he would go to work. Um, he was still leaving the house at around 6.15 every morning. He was still on the phone with his brother, the one that lived in Philly um, every morning. They would just, that was their time to talk. From what I was told, the brother got off work. I guess he must have worked the third shift. And so he was getting off work as Legion was getting ready to go to work. So that was the perfect time for them to talk. He would talk to um, his brother in Baltimore and the brother in Augusta. Pretty much, you know, just a quick phone call here and there. If not every day, every other day. So everything was pretty much the same. I would talk to my mom almost every day. I would talk to my aunt almost every day. Um, so it was it was nothing to kind of, hmm, that's weird. Um, that's what the morning routine was. He would talk. So I worked at Georgia State Patrol. Um, and I said this in a previous video, but again, there were things I said in previous videos that I remember saying, hey, remember that because it's gonna come back later. So I worked at Georgia State Patrol. I had been working there for almost eight years, seven or eight years by the time Legion got into the picture. He was fine with the fact that I worked um, within law enforcement. I'm not a trooper. I'm not a sworn officer. I'm a civilian. However, he, um, again, his dad was a retired police officer. So he was perfectly fine in the beginning with the fact that I worked for Georgia State Patrol. Um, he had been to my office before. He had met some of my um, co-workers. Obviously, even with COVID, because I still had to go into the office two or three days a week, he had been up there. So the friend who took me to the hospital when I had my miscarriage has met him. He and I have been to her home with her and her significant other before. So again, even in the world of COVID, when there were little times where you could get together with people, he has met people in my life. He has met um, my friend or that particular friend, and he has met some of my coworkers. So when we got married, the first two weeks, like I said, was fine. And then it's as if something snapped, um, something just changed. What was totally acceptable before, suddenly little comments were made. Why are you wearing that to work? You get off at 3.30, so you'll be home by 5, right? Things that had never happened before. He had never questioned what time I'm going to be home. Um, really, he didn't need to question it because when I'm off work, I, I leave. So... It was never a situation of, oh, I'm going to just sit around at work and just run my mouth because I have nothing to do. Um, and then it turned into, you know, he would call me every day 
from work. And I'm going to demonstrate how those phone calls went. But he would call me every day from work. And if he even so much as heard a male voice in the background, he would have little comments to me. Who was that? Are they in your office? You know, man, you know, I never know who's who's around you. Because it seemed like every time I call you, I have the hiccup, sorry. It seems like every time I call you, um, there's some man around. And I'm just like, you know, at first I kind of shrugged it off. I laughed it off because it really, truly was absurd to me. Um, But then it became a bit more frequent. And so I really just didn't feed into it because I'm like, I don't know if this is some insecurity. I don't know if this is jealousy because nothing has ever been done to make you feel any sort of insecure type of way. I've never entertained another guy, never flirted with another guy. Like, I don't know where this is coming from. So it is also important to note, we got married January 5th. Things started changing um, around two weeks later. And the reason why I know it's two weeks is because I had recorded an audio diary on January 21st is the date of the audio diary. And I talk about how maybe I had unrealistic, unrealistic expectations because it seemed as if things were changing with he and I. So two weeks pass. He starts making little comments. End of January comes. He informs me that he wants to start looking for a house again. I had no real desire to go through that process. So what he decides is that he's going to look for a house for us using his friend, the uh, realtor, the one I did not meet. So he tells me that he and his friend have been talking and he's going to start looking at houses. And what he's going to do is basically if he feels like it's a house I would like, then he wants to show it to me because he feels like, you know, I know that your attitude really isn't you're in the mood to look for a house. So I'm going to start looking. And then if I think it's a great house, then, you know, you can come see it. Um, And I remember thinking that's not like that's not gonna work you're not gonna choose a house without me he was like no i'm not gonna choose the house but i just think that you know me and old boy have been talking and so he has some houses that he is representing he wants to show me so why don't you let me look at it and if it's worth the time then i'll bring you to look at it so he already had some sort of plan in place after talking to his friend um, about how he's going to start looking at houses. This is Jan- this is the end of January 2021. So I kind of threw my hands in the air and was just like, whatever, because I'm not getting emotionally involved in looking at houses. And for me, that's kind of what it was. I felt like I would see a house, I could picture us living there, and then it gets snatched away somehow, some way. I didn't want to go through that. So the reaction that he wanted, which was for me to throw a fit, I did not do. I was just like, okay, all right. Like, I trust you. Um, And remember that I said the reaction he wanted, because that's going to come back later. So he started looking at houses. (sighs) Funny enough, the houses that he looked at, none of them I actually saw. But he would call me and say, I'm at this house in Sandy Springs with the uh, realtor friend. Apparently his his realtor friend's name was Scott, not to be confused with the other Scott, the one that was actually helping us that dropped us as clients. I want to make that clear. There were two Scots. One is the realtor who was representing us, who said, hey, I need proof of funds. If you don't have those proof of funds, I cannot show you any more houses. The other Scott is his friend who he had talked to on the phone at least 50 to 100 times in front of me. That's that's the Scott that he said is going to show me this house in Sandy Springs. Um, Apparently, the house was like eight hundred thousand dollars. So he was like, I think that um, if I you know, if I like the house, then I'm bring you out here so you can see it. All right. 
Now let's go into part 18. Okay, part 18, who the fuck did I marry? So he starts looking at houses in Sandy Springs, Alpharetta area with his friend, Scott. Um, I did not see any of these houses. I did not go. I didn't want to go. Um, so what was starting to change is, remember I said before, he would leave the house every day at around 6.15. He would be home every day between 3.30 and 4 o'clock without fail. It was so, I shouldn't say it was annoying, but it I could set my clock by the fact that I would hear that garage door open between 3.30 and 4 o'clock every day that he went to work. Even during lockdown, he still had to go to work. His job was only locked down for maybe a week. Um, for me, I was allowed to work from home, but unfortunately, I, I did not handle it well. And so I would fall asleep and not check email. So my boss was like, yeah, you're going to have to come back to the office because you're not trustworthy. And I wasn't. I mean, I totally, I would watch Netflix and not even be on my computer. So I had to start going back to work every day, five days a week. Um, And I was, (laughs) me and another lady were the only two in there because we were the only two who did not handle work from home properly. Anyway, that's another story. So Legion would, he started to not come home by four o'clock. He started to come home five, five thirty, six, six thirty, sometimes seven o'clock because he was saying that he was um, looking at houses after work with his friend Scott. So it definitely was noticed that things are changing. Um, And I just, at this point, kind of emotionally and mentally, I was just like, I don't know what to do. This is the end of January. Remember I told you in part 15, I got married January 5th. By January 31st, I kind of knew I was in trouble. And by the end of January, sure enough, I knew things were changing in a way that I was like, I hate to sound redundant, but what the fuck is going on? So he's still maintaining the story of looking for a house, looking for a house. I had already let him know my lease is up in August. When my lease is up in August, I am moving to Cobb County. Um, (laughs) <laughs> and then my attitude was kind of like, you can go with me or you can stay here. I don't care, but I'm moving. I'm leaving Clayton County. The reason why I want, I was so adamant to move was not because of Clayton County. It was not because of the house that I was in. It was because Legion had started to create this narrative that he was beefing with my female neighbor. He was trying to get me to believe that my female neighbor to the left of me um, somehow was interested in him. And so she would make these little comments and he would come in the house complaining about her and her music and the fact that she had, you know, different men over to the house. It was driving me crazy. And all of this was kind of starting in January. So when I say that it really seems like we got married January 5th and then We had two weeks of peace and then something just snapped. I literally mean something just snapped. So he's looking at houses. Now we're moving into February. February obviously is my birthday month. Um, He did good. He did good to make Valentine. He went all out for Valentine's Day. He went all out for my birthday. My birthday and Valentine's Day are... February 14th and February 15th. So um, he went all out on both days. <sighs> Y'all ain't even gonna believe this story. But I said I would share even when it makes me look bad. So the weekend after my birthday, and what I mean by that is if my birthday was on a Tuesday, we're talking about Saturday. Um, the weekend after my birthday, he gave me money to go to the nail salon go get a manicure and pedicure. So I leave the house. 
I take his car. His car was in the driveway. We had a key to each other's car because, again, we're married at this point. We're talking February 2021. So I take his car and I drive to the nail salon over in Morrow. I'm in the chair getting a pedicure and I get a text message from my husband saying someone was just at the house looking for you. And I'm like, who was looking for me? What do you, well, who was it? And he said, I don't know. I think it was some, this is through text. I don't know. I think it was some dude you used to mess with. Okay. Um, I was like, what are you talking about? He's, and he was like, I'm telling you, some guy just came to the house looking for you. I told him you were not here. So at this point, y'all, I'm in the chair at the salon. I'm freaking out because I'm like, who the fuck has the audacity to come to my home unannounced, uninvited, talking about they're looking for me? Especially because before I met my husband, I was working I was working the last shift at Amazon as a part-time job. So I had not dealt with, dated anything with anyone for about a year before I met him in March of 2020. So I really was like, who the hell is this coming to my house? So I finished the pedicure. I head home. Once I get home, I'm like, what what are you talking about? What happened? And so I'm frazzled in a way and he's calm he was like yeah it was a black dodge charger they pulled into the driveway they backed in they backed in as if they had been here before so clearly this was someone who who who's been to your house he got out the car he said i opened the door and i went out there and i said you know is there something i can help you with and he said the guy said i'm looking for and gave him my name and he said i'm sorry she's not here and he said, he was like, oh, okay. Um, all right then. And just got in the car and drove off. And I was like, my brain stopped working because I'm thinking, who the heck could this be? A Dodge Charger? I was like, are you sure that it wasn't law enforcement? Like, was it the sheriff's office trying to serve me with a lawsuit for a credit card I didn't pay? He was like, no, he was in regular clothes. He was like, and it was not a, um, a, a police car. It was on a marked unit, basically. And so I'm just like, who the heck could this be? And he was like, I know who it was. And I said, who? He was like, I think it was your ex. I said, what ex? He was like the one that you had dated for two years. Remember back in like part three, part four, I told y'all, he told me about his ex. I told him about mine. I thought we were being honest with each other. So now fast forward to February, 2021. And he's telling me, yeah, it, I think it was the ex that you had been dealing with for those two years before you met me. I said, so you think that he showed up to the house uninvited after two years and he was like well whoever it was clearly was comfortable pull backing into our driveway getting out the car and was like i'm here to see and gave me gave him my name um and so he was like she's not here is there something i can help you with and the guy was like nah nah it's cool um and then just got in the car and drove off so uh, again brain is like who who could this be so then legion says to me you know what the way that you react into this is real suspect and i'm like what are you talking about he was like you over here freaking out i told you i took care of it i told you it was fine and you over here freaking out which makes me wonder what are you, what have you been up to now let's go to part 19 Okay, part 18, who the fuck did I marry? So he says to me, the way you're acting is real suspect because I told you it was fine. I took care of it. He was like, I ain't even worried about it. He was like, obviously that nigga didn't know that you now married, that you've moved on. And so now he knows it. But for me, it was the fact that I don't do, I don't do pop-ups. 
don't come to my house unannounced. So if someone has done that, for me, it, it automatically feels like a violation and it feels like it needs to be addressed. So it was not as simple as I already took care of it. It's fine. Let it go. No, nah, we ain't letting nothing go because you don't have my permission to show up to my house. And before this turns into something where I'm going to be on Fox 5 News, I need to address that with you because that is not okay. So he didn't like the reaction I had to the story he told me where someone basically disrespected my home. And he felt like my reaction was really suspect. So um, what I'm I'm going to get into the little details that he did not know about. So he tells me again, it was a black charger, a black Dodge charger. They backed into the driveway. A gentleman got out of the car and he asked for me by name and Legion said, she's not here. So, um, I asked him, what does the guy look like? And he said, he was like, why does it matter? I said, what the fuck does he look like? So Legion proceeds to give me the most generic description you can give. He was like, well, um, he was shorter than me. Ex-husband is about six, three, six, four. He was shorter than me. Um, he was brown skin. I said, did he, ha- did he have a hat on his head? Mind you, I understand that before marriage, I was a damn fool understand that but every woman has that moment where you only gonna fool her but for so long and eventually stuff puzzles start coming together for me I felt like moving into marriage certain things started coming together so I said to him um did he have a hat on his head he was like nah he ain't wear a hat so in my mind, I am mentally going down a list of every possible man it could be. Um, and it was only like four men. I had been in that house about three or four years at this point. So I knew all of the people. And I'm talking about from maintenance down to ex-boyfriends. It was a total of like four men. So when he said that um, it was a black charger... I immediately was like, okay, I know that crosses out one. He said he was shorter than him. All of them were shorter than him. I said, did he have a hat on his head? He said, no, that crossed out one because one in particular was a maintenance guy who always wore a hat on his head because he had like a bruise or something and he he was just self-conscious about it. So he always wore a hat. That leaves two. So I said, was he muscular or was he skinny? So Legion's getting all frustrated. I said, just answer the question. He was like, well, he was kind of in between. And I said, okay. Um, he, he was in between. I said, so was he light skin or was he dark skin? He was like, I told you he was brown skin. I said, was he my complexion? He said, no, he was, he was brown skin. That eliminates one. So now there's one left. And yes, the one left would have been the ex that I had dated for two years. And so he was like, I know that I know it was your ex. I know it was your ex. And I was like, that don't make no sense because the ex that I, in my mind, I'm saying this, the ex that I had dated, he and I had no contact with each other. And he was not the type to just pop up at your house. That ain't his style. Not to mention, and I ain't tell Legion this, that man would not be caught dead driving a Dodge Charger. He hated chargers because he drove it as a patrol car. So I didn't say anything. I just was like, that's that's weird. So what Legion didn't know is that at the time I had a security system. So I had a security system where um, anytime the front door, the garage door or the back door was open, basically any entry point, anytime it was open or closed, it would send me a text message notification. So when he's telling me all this, I'm looking at my phone and I see a notification where the front door was opened and it was shut all within the same minute. So for example, if it says front door open at 1 p.m., 
front door closed at 1 p.m. So whatever he did was within those 60 seconds. He's telling me the story of the guy got out the car. Um, he opened the door. He went out there. Can I help you? And the guy said, um, I'm looking for. And Legion said, no, nah, she's not here. And so the, he said the guy kind of was like, OK. And he was like, all right, thank you. And got in the car and drove off. Legion has also told me that he watched him drive off, drive out of the neighborhood, which means because of the way the house was set up, the townhouse, he would have still been outside watching this. I could be wrong, but something in me was like that would take more than 60 seconds. So for the door to have been open and shut within the same 60 seconds, I was like, hmm, hmm. Okay, so also what he didn't know, we didn't have a ring door camera, but my neighbor did. And her ring door camera caught my driveway. It, it, the view of the camera could see my driveway as well as her driveway. Um, and so who, whoever was coming in the door, our driveways were right next to each other. And then on the, either, on the other side of it was the grass. So it was a, per, it was a perfect view of my driveway. So... So she, um, I had texted her and I said, Hey, were you home? Um, I think I texted her the next day. Cause I said, were you home on Saturday? Da, 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 da. And she said, um, no, I wasn't. What's up? You know, everything good. And I said, um, can you look at your security system and see if there was a car that came to my house? Um, at such and such time. And I know I, I did not tell her the reason I was asking, but I was like, is there any way that your security camera caught if someone came to my house um, at this time on Saturday. She's like, yeah, sure, I'll look. And so maybe about a couple of hours later, she texted me back and said, hey, I looked at the camera, but I didn't see anything. And I said, okay, by any chance, did it catch if someone maybe walked up the driveway? Like maybe it wasn't a car in the driveway, but someone walked up. She said, I didn't see anything with your driveway yesterday. So I said, okay. Um, and, I, and I knew, I knew that something in me again um, was like, nobody came to the house. So now here we are, um, a month and a half married. And now is when I'm like, why the fuck did he make that up? Because no one came to the house. No black charger came to the house, pulled back into the driveway. Nobody got out the car and asked for me. Nobody was looking for me. So now I'm, I was sitting in the bedroom thinking through all this and I'm like, why the fuck did he make that up? Because that's what happened. I'm looking at the text messages on my phone where he's telling me someone just came to the house looking for you. But no one came. So what was the purpose of that? And then I re and then something said to me, something in me said, he wanted to see your reaction. He He just wanted to see the reaction. You had been too calm. And so he wanted to see a reaction. So this man gaslit me like I was Georgia natural gas just to get a reaction. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to part 20 of who the fuck did I marry? All right. Part 20 of who the fuck did I marry? So after the black Dodge Charger incident, um, things were, were quiet. Legion was fine. Legion slept just fine. Me, that shit played over in my head for days and days and days. Um, on one hand, I was like, I know nobody came. My head knew nobody came to the house. My heart was like, but maybe he didn't make it up. So the head and the heart were absolutely playing a tug of war because Again, I really couldn't fathom that he was making it up. But nevertheless, I filed it in the back of my mind and my little filing cap, my, my mental filing cabinet. So a few weeks later, 
we go out to eat at this restaurant in Atlanta. Um, it's a burger place and I'm going to do my, my best by the time I post this to put the name of the burger place um, on the screen. So we go to the burger place, eat dinner. Everything was fine. As we are leaving, he says to me, did I ever did, did I ever show you where my grandmother's buried? This is the grandmother that passed away from COVID in 2020. And I said, no, I was like, we haven't been over here. And so he was like, let me, let me show you. So he drives us to the cemetery, which is not far from the restaurant. He drives us to the cemetery, goes around and around, and then it comes to um, like a little hill in the cemetery. And he was like, you see the headstone. The headstone had um, like a fam the family name on it. And it did not have, for example, John David Doe. It just had Doe. Okay. So there were no dates on it. So it, it reminded me of just a headstone where it was probably multiple family members buried underneath it. That's what it reminded me of. And so he was like, my grandfather and my grandmother are buried there. I do recall him telling me when the grandmother died in 2020 that she wanted to be buried next to his grandfather. And so he told, he, he we're sitting in the car because we can see the headstone like on top of the hill from the car. And he tells me that that is where his grandmother and grandfather are buried, that he was able, the family was able to get her um you know, her wishes were to be buried next to the grandfather. Okay. So as we are leaving, we take a different route home. So we get on the highway. If you're from Atlanta, you'll know what I'm talking about. We get on I-75 North. Um, and we're kind of just, we're just driving around, to be honest with you. But we're taking the scenic route. We get on I-75 North because... The reason why I remember is because when you're on I-75 North going towards Atlantic Station, on the right-hand side, you will see the Varsity. You'll see all these tall skyscraper buildings. One of the buildings has the letters NCR on the building. We, As we're coming up towards the building, he says to me, do you see the NCR building? I said, yeah. He said the building behind it my job bought that building that's where we're going to have um we're setting up operations and i was like why the hell would y'all buy a condiment company in downtown atlanta he was like no we're not doing production there it's just going to be offices and that's where we're going to handle like the business portion the production is still being done in gwinnett county out in duluth and so i was like oh okay he was like that's where i keep the company car so i was like the company car i said aren't you supposed to be bringing a company car home and he was like i don't want to bring the company car home because it's clayton county and it's a ninety thousand dollar car and i don't know i don't want no nah, i don't want no problems so he's telling me that he keeps the company car at the build the building downtown atlanta that's behind the ncr building I barely could see what building he's talking about, but he was like, it's the building right behind it. And so he's telling me that that's where his office is. So I said to him, take me to your office. I know it's a Saturday, but shit, you wanted the VPs, right? So take me to your office. No, I had not been to his office simply because again, COVID. So I was like, take me to your office. And he was like, he was like, I can. He was like, that's no problem. So do I have the other phone? I do. So y'all are in luck. So I can maybe reenact how this goes. So he gets off the exit and starts driving towards the NCR building. While he's driving towards the NCR building, he always has kept his phone in his left pocket. This is my left hand. So he pulls his phone out and he starts calling. He tells me he's calling Willie. Willie is supposed to be the head of security. So he's saying, oh, let me call Willie real quick to make sure that the building's open. So he proceeds, this is another phone, but he proceeds to go ahead and call Willie. He's still, we're still driving, by the way. We're still driving. I'm on the phone, you know, scrolling through Facebook, trying to figure out um, some random shit. But he's, he's driving with the phone up to it. So 
driving with the phone next thing i hear hey willie it's legion hey how's it going i'm good hey is the building open no i just want to take my wife up there so she can see it and see my office are you up there right now you're not okay is mr justin working okay so is there anybody up there that can physically open the building? Because I don't think my badge is going to get me at least in the front door because of it's, it's on the weekend lock. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me know. All right. Thank you, Willie. Bye. Y'all see how I did that? He's having this whole conversation while I'm sitting in a passenger seat. So then he gets off the phone and he says to me, Willie is not working and Justin apparently called out sick. So the building is locked and my badge won't get us in the front door. He was like, Willie's going to see if there's someone else that can open the that can open the front door so we can actually get in. He's like, my badge will get us on the floor, but it will not get us in the front door. <clears throat> no one ever called. So when he's getting off the highway, um, he basically turns onto Spring Street. Again, there's this, there's all kinds of shit I distinctly remember. He turns onto Spring Street so that he can then get on 75 South so we can go home. Never saw the office that day. Um, but again, this is where he's saying that he um, keeps the company car. So when we get to part 21, I'll kind of go into detail about the whole company car a little bit more. Part 21, who the fuck did I marry? So the company car apparently was a charcoal gray BMW. I believe it was a five series. It was a five series. I don't know much about the sedans. Y'all know I wanted the X5 dark blue with the cognac interior. He got the BMW 5 Series charcoal gray. He sent me a picture of the car. So I did see a picture of the car. Um, after this whole NCR building, take me to your office. That is what he's claiming is that he left. He leaves the company car at that location. He's saying that he drives from Riverdale to midtown switches out cars and then drives from um midtown to duluth those that don't know how metro atlanta is basically midtown would be in between where we live and duluth um i only know that he left the house every day at 6 15 i know that um i never physically saw the company car come to our home saw a picture pictures plural um so when he told me that he got a bmw 5 series keep in mind this is after <laughs> um i had been promised a dark blue x5 so i was a bit salty i don't care if it is a company car i was a bit salty i will admit that um because i felt like you you get to drive the car that you know i really want which is a bmw um and so he would always he would call me from the car he would tell me you know yeah i'm um i may i may just uh i may just drive home in this car and not switch car you know switch back to his personal car he was like i don't know he he did that a lot and I realize now in 2024, he did that because he knew how excited I was to actually see the car. Because shit, I wanted to test drive it myself, to be honest with you. And he knew that. So, reactions. Um, so, he would he would say stuff like that. Like, man, I'm so tired. I might just drive the, the company car, go ahead and go home. And then, you know, just let me park it in a garage type thing. So eventually he stopped doing that because I didn't want to hear nothing about that car. I'm driving a Nissan and you driving a BMW after you promised me a BMW. So I don't really want to hear nothing about it. So in terms of the company car, I did see that it was, it was a, according to the pictures, a charcoal gray uh, BMW 5 Series. If you're asking me the exact model, I don't know. 
but I know it was a five series because I know the seven series is slightly longer. So it was a five series sedan. Um, so after the whole situation with the cemetery to see his grandmother and grandfather's um, headstone, then there was the NCR, the office is open. Oh, it's not open. Justin ain't working. Willie ain't working. Willie is supposed to be head of security, but he ain't working. Okay. So at this point, I'm already numb. It is important for me to point out how numb I became dealing with him. Mind numbing because I just got to a point where it was like, there's always something. There's always something. So, of course, we're not going to go to the office because there's going to be something. Um, so, this is the end of February. My birthday had already passed. There clearly was tension on my end, not so much tension on his end. So, I get home a couple of weeks later. We are now in the beginning of March. This is something personal about me. The only way you would know this is if you know me. I have been dying, dying to go to London and Paris. Um, I had a layover in London when I did a study abroad, but it's not the same. I want to go to London and be a whole tourist. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I want to see Buckingham Palace. I want to see um, the Tower of London. I want to see Paris. I want to see the Palace of Versailles. This is something, if you know me, you know she wants to see Paris. She wants to see London. So I get home from work. This is the beginning of March. I get home from work and on the counter is a folder with like a little bow on it. And I'm like, oh, what is this? Is this like mail? Like, was this something that you got at work? He's like, nah, it's a surprise for you. I open up the folder. Inside the folder is like a trip itinerary. It is not an actual booked trip. It's it's like an itinerary. Um, a trip for two to go from Atlanta to London. Um, the trip was should have happened and it was it was um the uh fuck the month on there was like July. So it was a summer trip. So he tells me I'm going to take you to London. He was like, I try, I wanted to take you for your birthday, but certain things fell through. He was like, so this summer in July, we're going to go to London. He was like, I've already made a reservation for us to stay at the Savoy. Again, there are certain things that my brain just was like, remember that, remember that. He said, I've already made a reservation for us to stay at the Savoy. I know it as much as I want to go to London, y'all, I didn't know anything about the Savoy. And so I remember going to look it up because I was like, what is the Savoy? Well, apparently the Savoy is bougie, very bougie. So I was so excited. I cannot tell y'all how fucking excited I was when I saw that he had um, printed out British Airways. Like he was speaking my language. I am one of those people. I'm a planner. So when he's saying I'm going to take you to London and he took the time to research flights and print it out and research the Savoy and print it out. And there were there were different, ex not excursions, but there were different things that you could do. You could go see the Tower of London. You could go see see Buckingham Palace changing of the guard we could go have high tea at certain places he was like I don't really want to go but I know you're dying to go so he was like you know I love you and I would do anything for you blah blah black sheep have you any wool and so he was like I'm going to take you to London in July the trip did not include Paris that's fine but I was so excited so excited and so this is the beginning of March. I was like, this, this is great. Hopefully this happens. I knew I needed to renew my passport. And he was saying that he had to renew his passport as well because his passport had expired. So both of us were like, okay, we need to get on this if we're going to try to make it to London in July and it's now March. Me being the planner I am, I think I went to work the next day and printed out the passport applications so that we could fill it out and go ahead and get that process um, going. 
So, um, needless to say, something must have happened. And I don't remember what it was. We just simply didn't fill out the application for the passport. So, fast forward, we're now at mid-March. Mid-March, the decision was made that my mom, who lived in Arkansas, was coming to visit us. She would be coming, I believe, the second week of April, and she was going to stay a week um, and then a few days. So, like, maybe a total of nine days. Not quite two weeks, but a little over a week. So she was coming in April and I was excited. Legion was excited because he was excited to physically meet my mom. He had talked to her on Zoom. He had talked to her on the phone, but he was excited to physically meet my mom. And my mom was, was excited to physically meet her son-in-law. So this is mid-March. Um, I'm going to go into part 22 where I explain what happened. <laughs> with Facebook Messenger. Come. Part 22, who the fuck did I marry? So now we are in March. This is right after he had surprised me with the announcement of we're gonna go to London for um, a trip in July. Cause we definitely didn't do a honeymoon. We definitely didn't do any sort of trips together. So the idea was we're gonna do a trip in July together. Um. One thing about Legion was that <laughs> he was the guy who was like, I have nothing to hide. I don't lie. I don't like liars. Um, if we're in a relationship, then everything should be out in the open. So I've always had his cell phone passcode. Never felt the need to look through his cell phone. Um, and funny enough, I can tell y'all right now, disclaimer, I will never go through a cell phone again. Mm -mm, you cheat in peace. So anyway, um, so one day, this is mid-March, going like around March 20th. Um, so we're heading in towards the end of the month. He was in the shower. Keep in mind, my mom is coming for a visit in April. So he was in the shower and he received a text message on his phone from a woman. Um the text message because it was a preview so the text message was something where if you didn't know the context of the text thread you could either go left or you could go right with it so me being just curious i opened up the phone put the passcode in read the text then read the thread come to find out it was a text from his aunt his aunt and his ex share the same name that's why i say it could go left or it could go right text was from the aunt so um i went i looked at the text went, went through the thread nothing in there so i went ahead x uh x out of the um messages i see that he has facebook messenger downloaded and obviously it shows you the the number of um unread messages in the icon so it showed that he had like five unread messages. So I clicked on it just being nosy. And what do my wondering astigmatism I see? So in his Facebook Messenger is about seven women. I can see um, their profile picture and I see their names. Some of them had a preview the ones that um, he had not read, I could see the preview of the message. One in particular said, when are you going to come get this? Y'all know what I'm talking about. So I clicked on that one first. Um, and I'm reading through the thread. And so she's saying, when are you going to come get this? But earlier in the thread or further back in the thread, he had asked her, when are you going to give me? And she said, when lockdown is over. So from what I could piece together, he had not yet physically gotten with her. Um, but had there been no COVID, oh, he would have smashed all day, every day. Um, the other messages were in you windows, meaning the other messages from the other women were in you windows. They were not as graphic as the one between him and her. So I'm reading these messages and... What is interesting is that the person I am married to is not the person in these messages. Like, this man was on some nasty shit. 
and I say nasty not in a judgmental way but in a with me he seemed to act as if I was damn near virginal white and I clearly see evidence that you were into some shit that with me you acting like nah I ain't really into that so um I confronted him I absolutely confronted him and was like, what the fuck is this? If two plus two is four and five plus five is 10, what the fuck is this? Um, and so he did not, you know, oh, that ain't, that ain't what happened, blah, blah, blah. Instead, what he hit me with is, man, I was just playing around. Like, ain't nothing happened. Um, you know, I shouldn't have said all that, but I was just flirting. It, it ain't mean nothing. I don't even know that girl. I was just flirting. And so I'm like, is this what you into? And so he was like, no, it's not what I'm into. It was just stupid. It was stupid because I shouldn't have done it. So I'm going to be honest with y'all because I've been honest all this time. What pissed me off the most was that here I am as a woman behaving, trying to do the right thing by him and this marriage. And you mean to tell me you out here offering your dingling to random chicks that you don't even know. I was more angry at the fact that I'm like, dude, do you know how much I have turned down in order to be faithful to your dumb ass? And I'm seeing that you basically are out here acting like you got Skittles taste the rainbow. I was hurt. I was angry. I thought about getting my lick back. I ain't, I'm just being honest. I did. Um, and he, he played it off like it ain't nothing serious. It ain't nothing serious. Don't overreact. Don't get emotional. It was just dumb. He was like, I will delete the messages. I'll even delete messenger. And I, and I told him, I was like, that's really not good enough. Cause that, that's not going to fix the root of the issue. So this is where I introduced that we need to do marriage counseling. He didn't have any issue doing marriage counseling. We did not do premarital counseling, um, but he was like, that's fine. He was like, I don't have no problem doing marriage counseling because if anything, it can help us. So I thought that, okay, he may not have physically cheated from what I could see on the messenger. He may not have physically cheated, but he damn sure got caught, you know, d doing a little something, something, because they had exchanged pictures. So y'all know what pictures he sent. And I was disappointed because I don't like men that send, <laughs> I don't like men that send those type of pictures. But anyway, that's another issue. So we agreed that we would start marriage counseling. We also agreed that we would put on a united front when my mom got there. In other words, we were not going to argue. We, you know, just let's just act like everything is fine. But at that point, when my mother arrived in April, I could not stand him. I did not want to be, but we couldn't, um, he moved back into our bedroom because he had, he had moved into the guest bedroom when I saw the messages. Like three days before she came, he moved back into the bedroom because obviously she needed to sleep somewhere. So, um, I really could not stand him. And it was because I was busy second guessing myself like, damn, what's wrong with me? Like, if that's what you into and I'm supposed to be your wife, like, let's have conversations like shit i went to fam you i understand some stuff buddy so it, it just was one of those things where it made me second guess like what's wrong with me what did i do wrong what is it that she got that i don't um because you all out here willy-nilly you know messaging her all hours of the night because the thread went back quite a few weeks i saw it in march there were messages from december november so again, I'm just second guessing all kinds of stuff, self-esteem taking a hit. So no, I did not want to be around him. I did not want, um, I, I, I didn't like him, period. I did not like him. I left and I would just go for a drive because driving clears my mind. I called my aunt, told her what happened. I don't recommend that. I don't recommend calling family to tell them what's going on in your marriage. But I called my aunt and my aunt, lovingly was like what do you want me to say you married him you know he ain't your boyfriend y'all can't just break up that's the hard part about marriage is like i mean yeah i guess you could leave him but at the same time 
you married him. So, honey, you're going to have to go back home. And y'all are going to have to figure this out. She was like, I can't give you advice on what you should do. I'm sorry that this happened. But, uh, but you married him. So, even though it was just one drive, I went back home. And that's when the discussion was, um, we need to do marriage counseling. 23, who the fuck did I marry? So, we agreed to do marriage counseling. Um, I had found a pastor and his wife who agreed to do our counseling, basically. Our counseling was going to be on Zoom, and it was going to be every other week, um, every other Tuesday. Initially, Legion was... Um, participating in it um his body language seemed to be that he was open and receptive to the marriage counseling now the pastor and his wife were deeply concerned at the fact that we had only been married three months and we were already dealing with some form of infidelity we were in marriage counseling and <laughs> as the pastor would put it there seems to not be any sort of intimacy. Um, they were concerned. Rightfully so, I think any person would be if they knew what was going on within those three months. So um, the pastor and his wife, it is, it is fair to note, we started counseling with them um, in the spring. We continued counseling with them up until a week before I found out what I found out and he got kicked out. So one of the first things that um, the pastor kind of talked to us about was, um, you know, are you, what, what was the deal with the Facebook Messenger stuff? Um, and Legion was like, it was stupid. I shouldn't have done it. Um, it was just, it really was just attention. And it just, I got carried away. He, he felt like he was not going to, he kept saying, I'm not going to keep apologizing. I'm not going to keep getting persecuted um, after I told you, I'm sorry, I told you I wouldn't do it again. And I want us to move forward. You're either going to forgive me or you're not. The pastor and his wife were like, wow, um, the audacity is real on this one. <laughs> so needless to say, we started moving slowly forward. Um, it was always in the back of my mind, just like it was in the back of my mind with that black Dodge Charger. It was one of those things where, okay, I see how you kind of are moving and operate. He came to me a few days after we started our first counseling session. And he was like, we should um, get a joint bank account. What he wanted to do was to each one of us have our own account and to get a joint account for our money to go in there um, for joint expenses. Now, up until this point, he had been paying the rent, the utilities, and I really was just paying for my stuff. So now he's suggesting, look, we're married now. Let's go ahead and get a joint account. I wasn't necessarily against it because I knew that I would still have my own account. I would still have my own savings. So what I countered with was, okay, let's take a look and see what we're working with. Show me your checking. Let's, let's look at each other's accounts. Look at what we have currently. He was cool with that. So he shows me his checking account. His checking account available balance was about, it was just over 9,600. Mine's was just over 1500 so there was a huge disparity in the amounts. Um, and so he logged in on the phone and turned it towards me, and I could see available checking, you know, available balance, just over 9600 I logged into my savings. I showed him how much I had in savings. He logged into, picked up his phone, da -da 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 -da, logged into his Chase savings, turned the phone towards me. In the Chase savings, it was roughly about 15000 But I also knew that he told me he had a U.S. bank savings and he had an offshore savings. So at this point in time, I asked him, show me the U.S. bank savings. Show me, show me the other two accounts. He would not do it. This became a huge bone of contention. 
he would not show me the two accounts that he claims has the most money in there, the accounts that he claims has money for a house in there, because he still was mentioning, hey, we need to get on this house thing if we're going to move um, when the lease is up. So I'm just adamant on why aren't you why don't you want to show me your savings account? You showed me the chase one. Like, what is the big deal? And so he kept saying, he was like, there's a lot of money in there. And he was like, and my uncle always taught me, this is not the uncle that died, another uncle. My uncle always told me, you know, j just keep your money tight because women can be, I said women, like we're married. So go ahead and show it to me. He would not show it to me. So then we went back into marriage counseling, like the next session, and I bring it up. I said, he will not show me these two accounts that he claims has the money in there to buy a house. I told a pastor and his wife, I said, I saw the pre-approval letter, so I don't understand why he's not going to show me to just put me at ease that he has the money in there. I had never questioned it before because again, you tell me who in their right mind signs their name to a legally binding offer, an all cash offer on a house. And they, they just do it willy nilly. I don't know anyone that does that. So I actually never questioned what was in the savings because I clearly saw him sign his name to a $699,000 all cash offer on a house. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back to the parts in this playlist where I talk about what he did when we were looking for a house. So the pastor and his wife were like, Legion, that's not his name, y'all, that's a nickname. Legion, why would you, why would you not show your wife your savings account? Like what, what's going on here? And so he made up some bullshit. And I remember the pastor's wife was like, something, something ain't right. And so at this point, Legion kind of shuts down. He's just like, look, y'all are not going to tell me when and where I can open. I open up my accounts to show anybody the money I earned. I earned that money. I earned that money by playing football, blood, sweat and tears. He went to this whole Denzel Washington monologue about how he earned that money. And no one, no woman, no one is going to come in and tell him that he needs to open up the account. So then he starts talking about the ex-wife and how she tried to get money from him in the divorce back when they were in California. So now the pastor and his wife, their red flags are just like, whoa, so much so that the pastor's wife said, and I will never forget this. She said, I don't think you all are going to make it to January. What she was talking about is I don't think y'all are going to make it a year. And I really, truly was like, we're going to make it like, of course, we're going to make it. And she was just like, I don't have a good feeling about it. And so Legion's all defensive. He, he at this point, he's folding his arms and he and because remember, we're on Zoom. He's folding his arms and he's just like, I'm, I'm done with this, like. I'm not going to get attacked because I'm not comfortable showing you the amount of money that I have. Money changes people and I'm not comfortable. So he's playing that victim card. Um, and so the pastor and his wife were like, you know, we we're, we're still going to help y'all as much as we can. But so he was like, I'm not comfortable. And basically the pastor and his wife were like, look, we'll help y'all as much as we can, <laughs> but there's some deep issues here. And, you know, had you, this is what they advised us. Had the two of you came to us for premarital counseling, we would have told you, do not get married. Y'all should not even be together. That is what our parents, <laughs> That is what the pastor and his wife told us in marriage counseling. If you two had come to us for premarital counseling, we would have told you y'all should not even be together, let alone get married. But here we are. So we will help you guys as much as we can. But the pastor's wife was like, I don't have a good feeling that y'all are going to make it a year. Part 24. Who the fuck did I marry? 
So remember, we're in April. Um, we're now moving towards the end of April. And he still did not show me his um, savings account. Saw the checking, saw the Chase savings. So he decides that we should start looking for a house again because my lease was up in August and I made it very clear that when the lease is up, I am moving. I wanted to move to Cobb County. So um, he was like, you know, we need to get the ball rolling. I didn't want any parts of it. Didn't want any parts of it. He found a realtor. This time it was a woman. It was a woman. Um, and I believe her name was Amber. I think her name was Amber. So he found a realtor and um, kind of we, you know, he told her what the budget was. Amber started finding houses. So please understand or you don't really have to understand, but um, I believed I believed he was a sane, rational human being. Sane enough that you would not sign a, an offer on a home if you didn't have the money. That's what I believed. So when we started working with Amber, Amber, I believe, showed us three or four houses. It was not nearly as many as the other realtor, Scott. So one of the houses um, absolutely loved. Ugh. I love the house. Um, I really wanted to put in an offer on that house and I'm going to post it on the screen, the house. Love that house. It was just absolutely beautiful. And once again, he wanted to put in an all cash offer on the house. But before he could put in an all, he had told Amber, I want to put in an all cash offer. And what Amber, the woman, was smart enough to say is, okay, let's just go ahead and take it one step at a time. Let's go ahead and get your pre-approval stuff together. She said, I work with a great lender who, if, you, if you're not already pre-approved, um, he can get you pre-approved, no issues. Um, and then if you want to do an all cash offer, then we'll go ahead and get the proof of funds together. So that way we can submit it all with your offer. Jesus. Y'all already know what happened because you remember what happened on the last house with Scott. Um, basically, Legion was like, well, I can get you whatever you need. That's fine. But... I really don't want to submit proof of funds unless they accept the offer. Amber, and I don't know where she is. I don't even know if she'll ever see this video. Um, anyway, let me keep going and I'll explain why that woman has a special place in my heart. So Amber was like, you know, I totally understand. Um, but this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to need that paperwork, okay? And um, we'll submit it with your offer. It, she she just simply was like, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. And so he did not submit the paperwork um, when she had asked him to. And I remember I was driving to work and I stopped at the quick trip on Upper Riverdale Road in Riverdale, Georgia. And Amber had called me. It was it was in the morning. She had called me. Um, and I believe with all my heart that Amber knew something was up, but she also knew I did not know what was up. So she called me and she was like, I just don't understand. Like, if he has the paperwork, like you can submit the paperwork. But the issue was the Chase paperwork that I had was from a year prior. So my understanding was that it pretty much was no good at this point. Um, 
So she said, he can, all he has to do is just email it to me or take a picture of. She was like, I just need to know that he's able to back up his offer. And I said, I totally get it. Um, and she was explaining some stuff to me. She was like, you know, he needs to do X, Y, and Z. And so I said to her, I remember I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, um, I'm going to get down to the bottom of it, but I don't know what's going on. And so let's put a pause on this whole thing. Let's put a pause on looking at houses. Let's put a pause on um, getting his pre-approval letter because I'm not sure what's going on. And she got quiet and she said, okay. I said, and I know this sounds weird. And she said, no, she said, that is actually very smart. She said, um, do your research. And if I can be of assistance, call me. She said, whether you buy a house with him or you buy a house on your own, I will be more than happy to represent you. I don't know where Amber is today. But that one sentence, I felt like, I felt like just woman to woman, she was basically telling me something ain't right, baby, something ain't right, and now you need to open your eyes. I'll be more than happy to work with you um, if y'all get your shit together. I'll work with both of you. But whether you buy a house or not, do your research and then let me know what I can do. That was our conversation at the quick trip on Upper Riverdale Road. So I got off the phone. Um, that was the last time that we worked with any sort of real realtor. That was the last time that we looked at any sort of house. Um, and I don't know, I don't remember exactly what happened after that meeting that day. I do know that when I went home, I simply told him, I don't want to look at a house right now. Um, I said, I think it's okay if we rent. Um, we'll just find a house in Cobb County and just rent um, for a year. And let's, and let's build, you know, save some more money. Let's just, um, let's not worry about buying a house right now. And basically what I was trying to do was save face because that was the first time with Amber that I actually was embarrassed at the fact that we're wait, we, he and I, because I felt like I was complicit in the fact that I'm going to look at houses with him. I felt like we are wasting these people's time. I did not mean to waste your time. I clearly see my time as being wasted, but that doesn't mean I need to waste your time. And I felt embarrassed at the fact that we wasted her time um, coming across as serious buyers. When time came to put up or shut up, nothing was put up. And I knew nothing. I had nothing to add to the, to, to add to this because we're talking about a $650,000 house and, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't make that. I don't make anywhere near that. So it, was, it just became one of those situations where I was trying to save face. I was trying to save face with my husband and I was trying to save face with Amber. And so I did say to him, let's just rent for another year and then let's see um, at that time where we are if we should go ahead and buy. So now is when shit is about to get real. Part 25, who the fuck did I marry? So we weren't looking at houses anymore. We were not working with a realtor anymore. The end of April, I had decided that I wanted to look for another job. I did. The reason I wanted to look for another job is petty. Yeah, it is. I wanted to look for another job because I was pissed off at the fact that, um, I had basically was dependent on him to help with the car note. 
So I wanted to look for another job where I could afford life all by myself, including that car note, basically where I would make more money. I told him that I was going to start looking for another job. He laughed. And his exact words were, you're not going to leave Georgia State Patrol. He was like, I swear you love them niggas more than you love me. He laughed. So that fueled me even more. So I was hitting the pavement hard trying to find another job. I was applying to all kinds of places. Got a phone call um, from my current job. So this is how I ended up in my current job. Got a phone call um, They and they had sent me an email with a background packet. The background packet was long and extensive, but in the background packet, it asked for my spouse's full name, my spouse's date of birth, and my spouse's social security number. So I showed it to Legion and I was like, I need your social because, you know, I'm applying for this job. It's a great job. It's way more money. Um, and, you know, we're talking about moving anyway to Cobb County. So this, you know, this, this is a God thing. He did not want to give me his social. I explained, I showed him the paperwork where I was like, look, because we are married, I I can't lie on here. So help me. <laughs> um, so he writes down his social security number on the background packet. And um, I eventually turned it in. I had scanned it, saved it in my email and, and sent it in. And I looked at it one day, be, just going through it, just making sure I didn't really miss anything. All T's were crossed, all I's were dotted. And I looked at his social and something about the social seemed different than the social security number that I remember seeing when we did our marriage license. And so for those who you remember in the previous part, I said I had ran his social security number from the marriage license. Nothing came back. So I thought that I had written it down wrong. Basically, what it is, is that the first three numbers were different on the background packet than what was on the marriage license. If you don't know this, here's a little trivia. Your social security number, the first three numbers pretty much are dictated by the state you were born in and the state that issued your birth certificate. So he was born in Pennsylvania. So his social, the first three letters, excuse me, the first three numbers of his social security number should be attributed to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, shit, they probably got like five, six different numbers, uh, three digit numbers that your social security number can start with. So the social that was on the marriage license, for example, um, was probably one, two, three. What was on the background was four, five, six. Both of those social security three digit prefixes are issued through the state of Pennsylvania. Again, this is an example so I can make it clear. So when I saw his social on my background, I immediately knew that was a different social than what I saw on the marriage license. Um, and when I compared, because I, f I had found a copy of the marriage license that we turned in because I had filled it out on the computer. So sure enough, the first three numbers were different. The rest of the numbers were the same. So one of two things, either when I ran his background, I did in fact put in the wrong number or the number on the mayor's certificate or the um, background packet is wrong. So I decided that I was going to roll the dice and take the social from the background packet. Again, this is the background packet that I had to fill out to get my current job. I was trying to get a new job. Okay, so I took that social and I ran a background check on it. What came back on this particular background were was all the addresses that the social security number, I guess, had been um, attached to. So all of the addresses 
the states were Georgia, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania. What I did not see was California. So I thought that was weird. I thought, okay, maybe this is not a complete background because clearly he went to San Diego State. It's on his resume. It's on it's on quite a few things. Social media. He didn't have a LinkedIn, but it was on his social media. So clearly he had he had been to California. So maybe I just need to do a different background check. Also to note during this time, he, um, I think I told you guys, he had hit his leg at work. So what was happening was it was getting more and more difficult for him to walk, like put pressure on that leg, on that knee. Um, he was still able to go to work. He was, he was still leaving at 6.15 in the morning. He was still coming back between 3.30 and 4 o'clock. But I clearly could see where he was in pain. Um, he would elevate the knee, ice the knee. It was it was getting worse. And I was constantly like, go to the doctor. Let me take you to urgent care so that they can look at this knee because you shouldn't still be limping and having a hard time um, putting weight on that knee. And every single time he was like, oh, you know, it's, it's fine. I have a doctor's appointment on Wednesday. The doctor just told me to ice it and to elevate it. Um, this happened. This is an old football injury. It happens all the time. It used to happen a lot when I was out in California. So I'm mentioning this knee issue for a reason. Um, but back to the background. So once again, when I ran the background the second time with his second social, it showed me states of Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. And that is all this that's all that I saw in terms of addresses. I didn't see anything for California. So by this point, we're moving into May of 2021. Things are starting to reopen. One of the things that reopened was San Diego State. So I called San Diego State. I called the registrar's office, registrar's office. Um, someone did answer and there was there was um, instructions on how to request a transcript. Um, I was able to try to request it online. You needed the person's the student's name and I believe you also need their social. And when I typed it in, it said no results found. Um, I believe that I sent an email asking, you know, this person is, is saying that they were a student there. Can you verify it? The response I got was there were no records found with that social security number. <laughs> so I'm like, OK. I asked him about it. And in part 26, I'll tell you exactly what his response was. Part 26, who the fuck did I marry? So I asked Legion, what's the deal about San Diego State? He was like, what are you talking about? And I said, um, why is there no records of you there? <laughs> I just came right out and said it. Without missing a beat, this man said, well, I was a private citizen. What the fuck does that mean? And what he said is that when he started at San Diego State, his father paid money so that, okay, it's important I'd say this with a straight face. His, his father paid money so that his name and social would not be publicized and he would be considered a private student, a private citizen. Um, he said that he had a card where all he had to do was show the card. He does not have to give his name. He does not have to give any information because he had that card. He said, so San Diego State would not public would not have any record of him, but he was, in fact, a student there. I said, and you claim that you played football. He was like, I did play football. I said, so you're saying that the school did not publish your name anywhere 
and they were in violation of NCAA rules. And he was like, why are you asking all these questions? And I said, I'm just curious. I'm just, meh, meh, I'm just curious. You're saying that you were a private citizen, but yet how did you, how were you in compliance with NCAA if you were a private citizen and they did not publish your name on any roster? So that was his excuse. He was like, all I can tell you is that I was a private citizen. My dad paid for it. Okay. So now I know that San Diego State has no record of him. Now I know that his social security number, at least the one that's on my back, my background packet, only shows that he listed in, he, excuse me, only shows that he lived in Georgia, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania. Okay. So at this point, the pain in his knee is getting worse. Uh, it's getting to the point where when he would come home from work, he would take a shower and immediately get in bed, elevate his knee. He was he was not even eating um, the way that he used to eat. It was getting to the point where at times, um, if you remember when I told you all about the miscarriage, they gave me pain meds because I had taken that pill. But the pain meds I was allergic to, so I couldn't take them, but I still had them. So the pain in his knee was getting to the point where he would take one of those pain meds just to get through the night. He was constantly in agony, constantly kind of tossing and turning, so much so that in May he moved into the guest bedroom because I couldn't deal with the tossing and turning thing. And he just said he was more comfortable there. So what what at first was a, oh, I hit my knee at work, turned into, no, it was an old football injury. This has happened before. Turned into, you know, it's painful for me to walk on it. Turned into, it's, it's actually hard for me to work on it. Um, but he was, he was still going to work at 6.15 every morning and coming home between 3.30 and 4. So... Um, it is, again, I'm just giving you guys the chronological order of how all this happened. So at this point, we're not looking at, we're not looking for a house. Um, I still have not seen the two savings account. I'm pretty sure there's no money in those savings accounts. But again, he was going to put in an all cash offer with Amber, the real realtor. So I really didn't know what to believe, but I I believed what I saw, which is I saw that that background is not showing where he went to California. So at one point in May, it was close to mid-May, he calls me from work. He calls me from work, calls me while I'm at work and tells me that he got a phone call from his stepson. The phone call from his stepson, the stepson was crying and was just absolutely distraught. And I'm at work in my office like, what's going on? And he says to me that the stepson informed him that his stepdaughter passed away. That she died from COVID. The stepson, this is the story. The stepson found her in her apartment because they had not heard from her for a couple of days. And she was unresponsive. He called the ambulance. They pronounced her dead when she got to the hospital. So he was calling to tell me that she had died. Um, and he was also calling to ask me if I would object to him giving his ex-wife $2,000 towards the funeral. As I've stated before, and I, and I still am this way to this day, I don't play about death. So when he told me that she died, I immediately went into the, all right, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, whatever we can do to help, let's help. Because 
surely nobody would make that up. So he, he again, he was like, are you are you OK with that? He was like, we're married. And the agreement was that anything over five hundred dollars would be a discussion. So two thousand definitely. And I said, yeah, I said, that's totally fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, he was upset because, again, he was close with the kids. And my heart went out to his ex-wife. It did because I I can't even imagine. I cannot even imagine. So part 27, who the fuck did I marry? So here's where we are at and here's what we can establish. Number one. I ran an initial background check on the social security number that was on our marriage license. Nothing came back. I subsequently applied for another job. In that job, I had to fill out a background packet. The background packet asked for my spouse's name, date of birth, and his social security number. The social security number on the background packet for the new job did not match the social security number that he gave me for our marriage license. If you are confused, I believe it's in part 25 or part 26 that I explain that. So we can establish that I then ran a background check on the new social security number that was on my background packet. It came back with um, address or excuse me, states that it that the social security number apparently had lived in. Those states were Georgia, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. Okay. I decided, this is now around May 20th, I decided to do another background check. Um, And I paid to do another background check. This time, I did it with a different company, and not only did it give me the addresses, excuse me, not only did it give me um, the states, it gave me addresses, and it also gave me names of people who were like associated with Legion and that address. One of those names was his ex-wife. I've always known, he's he's always told me the name of the ex-wife, but now I see it when I ran his background. I did a search for her on social media. She was not there. So the address that it showed that she was associated with, with him, because remember his story is, we got married in San Diego, we lived in San Diego, we divorced in San Diego. Men lie. Women lie. The U.S. federal government, which your social security number, does not. So um, he's saying he was always in California. His social security number never showed that he was in California, according to the background check. It did show that he had lived in Georgia at an address associated with the ex-wife. So... Tried to find the ex-wife, could not find her on social media. So I looked in the metro counties to protect her identity. This, I am going to not divulge a lot on this part. I looked in the metro counties in the um, the open record courts. So typically, you know, you can look in like superior court or magistrate court or probate court. So I looked in open records for the different counties, metro counties, metro Atlanta counties. Let me be clear, metro Atlanta counties. And I looked under her name and I found where they had filed for divorce in a metro Atlanta county. So when he said that he filed for divorce in San Diego and that he was married in San Diego, I was able to find, no, according to the state of Georgia, you were married here. You were divorced here. So I looked under her name, found a record, found a record for divorce, and it did show his name. So now I clearly see on my computer that there is a Metro County, Metro Atlanta County court that has a divorce record in the state of Georgia between him and his ex-wife. So I did what any 
rational person would do because this is still kind of COVID time. Um, well, not really. It had nothing to do with COVID. Let me take that back. Because of the parameters of the court, you can only do the open records request in person. I did what anybody would do. I told my boss I had to go. I grabbed my purse, grabbed my keys, and I drove to the court to do the open records request in person. The open records request was for the divorce documents. Go back in the story in the series. And remember, I went over, I did a background on the ex-wife. I told you all exactly what was told to me. He met her in California. He married her in California. He divorced her in California because she cheated on him. He filed for divorce. She tried to get spousal support. It, it, turned, it was going to be a little ugly. He was helping her with the kids. That was the story that was told to me. So... Went to the court, filled out the paperwork, got the open records request for the divorce decree, for the divorce records. First thing I see, he didn't file, she did. Second thing I see, they didn't make it more than six months. I see the, the date of marriage. I see the date of, the date of uh, dissolution, six months. Second, uh, third thing I see, he was served in Metro Atlanta, which means that at the time of the divorce, he was living in Metro Atlanta. Had nothing, California was never mentioned. Fourth thing I see, he filed what is called a pop, pauper affidavit. If you don't know what that is, I'm going to do my best to explain it real quick. Basically, he filed an affidavit with the court saying that he is so poor, he could not afford the fees to pay for a divorce. He couldn't afford a filing fee. He couldn't afford a service fee. That is what a pauper affidavit is for. All of this is in um, the divorce documents. She had filed she said it was irreconcilable differences. She was not requesting any money whatsoever. Um, and both of them had signed a pauper affidavit. He was served in Georgia at his previous employment. According to the divorce documents, he was served at like a grocery store. That is what was listed as his employer. And it had a date of when he was served. So I see all of this in one day. I also see where on the divorce documents, she listed her name, her address, and her phone number. So I did what any rational person would do. I wrote down the phone number. There was a 50-50 chance that the number was already disconnected. She could be like me. I'm one of those people. Honey, you can sneeze at a 27-degree angle. I will change my number so quick, you ain't even know what hits you. You can talk to me at 5 o'clock, and at 5.05, my number has been changed. So she could have been like me, and the number is not even active. Or she could be like some people I know who have kept their number since kindergarten. Either way, I wrote the number down. I um, left the court and I immediately went back to work. And the same friend who helped me when I had my miscarriage, I told her, I was like, I got this phone number. This is the ex-wife. She was like, girl, you better call. You better call and, fi and find out from her. Because can't no, I think she said to me, can't nobody tell you what is going on quite like the ex-wife. So, part 28 is the phone call that I had with the ex-wife. Part 28 of who the fuck did I marry? So, I had the phone number, went back to work. Um, my really good friend was like, you better call her. You can use my phone, but call her. So I called her. Um, she answered. Let me use aliases. Um, and the conversation went like this. May I please speak with Barbara? This is Barbara. 
Barbara, this is Shirley. Shirley who? This is Shirley Jones. I am the wife of Legion. Silence. Then she starts laughing. And she said to me, and I quote, if you were calling me, then I know it's bad. I chuckle and I said to her, I'm not trying to bother you. I'm not trying to disrupt your life. I, I said, I am literally coming to you on some woman to woman shit. I said, because you are probably the only person who can help. <laughs> she and she she listened. She was she was gracious. And she said, um, she said, what is it that you need to know or what is it that you want to know? And I said, I understand that you and my husband talk and communicate. Um, and she was and she immediately said, what? No, we don't. And I said, okay. Um, she said, one thing you need to know about Legion. She said, whatever he tells you, it is a lie. And she said, when he, again, let's go back to part one. I told you guys that when he introduced himself or when we met we actually had matched on two different sites and he was under two different names. One was an act was like the actual birth name. The other one was a nickname variation of that name. That's the name I know him by. So for example, if his name was Matthew, he had a profile under Matthew and then he had a profile under Matt. I would have known him as Matt. So she said to me, she was like, I don't even know who Matt is. She was like, that's not even his name. And so I knew what his actual government name is. She was like, no one calls him Matt. She was like, that must be his new, um, his new personality. Or she, she was cracking a joke, but she was like, anything he tells you, you need to know is a lie. So I just asked her, I said, what was your experience? I said, because I can tell you the story he told me and she and she stopped me right there. She said, whatever he told you was a lie. She said, let me guess. He told you I cheated on him. Let me guess. He told you that I wanted money from him. And I said, yeah. And she said, yeah, that's a complete lie. Um, so we had a conversation where she told me how they met um, they didn't meet online or anything. I said, well, were you guys ever in California? She said, no. She's like, he, he, she was like, that man ain't never been from past the East coast. So I said, okay. Um, so you guys have always been in Georgia. And she said, yeah. She's like, we got married in Georgia and we got divorced in Georgia. And that's when she asked me, how did you even get my number? She said, because, I want nothing to do with him. So how did you get my number? I told, And I said, I'm going to tell you the truth. It ain't going to make me look good. I told her, I said, this is, this is what happened. And this is what led to me doing research. And this is how I got your number. And she laughed. She was like, wow. She, said, she was like, normally I would be freaked out. She said, but under the circumstances, she was like, wow. Okay. Um, she said, yeah, if you're calling me, then it must have gotten pretty bad. She said, so what did he promise you? And we talked for about 30, 35 minutes. She asked me in that phone call, she said, look, I want nothing to do with him. I have not spoken to him since our divorce was finalized. She said, so I would just appreciate if you keep me out of whatever's going on with y'all. And I told her, I said, I give you my word. I will never tell him I spoke to you. I said, I give you my word. I said, this, this, this conversation is for me. It is not for me to use in any sort of legal litigation, nothing. This is for me. And, um, 
I said, I, I said, I don't plan to call you again. I don't plan to be a disrupt a disruption in your life. I just needed to know how bad is it? And she was she paused and she said, It's bad. She said, I don't know what all y'all got going on. She said, but if it's anything like what it was for me, it's bad. So we talked a little bit more. She was very encouraging. She was like, girl, do not blame yourself. She said, um, I went through that and I, I had blamed myself. She was like, this is not on us. This is on him. Um, she was like, he is a master liar, a master manipulator. She said, I ignore the red flags. So she was like, do not feel as though this is on you. We talked about um, the ex. There's an ex girlfriend that shares the name that shares the same name as his aunt. She and I talked about her. She said um, the reason why they broke up because the ex girlfriend. I didn't know this. The ex girlfriend had reached out to her about six months before he met me, and so. The ex-girlfriend lives in um, lived in Douglasville. On Legion's driver's license, he had a Georgia driver's license with the Douglasville address. What he told me was that it was the address that his sister, because remember I told y'all his sister Shantae lives in Douglasville. She's a nurse married with two kids. So he told me that the address on his license it was his driver's license was to Shantae's house. The ex-wife is telling me, no, that's the address for the girlfriend, the ex-girlfriend. He had moved in with her and he created this whole narrative with her. She found out um, that he was lying and she kicked him out. And so I guess after she kicked him out, she then um, reached out to the ex-wife, kind of the way I did for confirmation. And so the ex-wife was just telling me, whatever that man has told you, it is a lie. She said, I got out before it got too bad. Um, she said, because once I knew he was lying, I was out. She was like, because he's never going to change. <laughs> um, and so, again, conversation went on and on. And so finally, we were getting ready to get off the phone. And before we got off the phone, I said to her, I said, if everything is a lie, I said, I have one question for you. And she said, sure. I said, how is your daughter? I said, how is your daughter? Next part coming up. Part 29, who the fuck did I marry? So I asked her, how was your daughter? She said, my daughter's fine. And I said, okay. She said, what did he say about my daughter? And I will be honest with y'all. I didn't have the heart to tell her. So what I said instead was, oh, no, it was, you know, with everything with COVID, I think he mentioned that she might have um, she might have had COVID or was exposed to it. I downplayed it bad. I wasn't going to tell that woman that he said her daughter passed away. Um, so. She did, I said, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm glad to hear that kids are fine. She, she said, look, whether you stay with him or not is your choice. She said, he ain't going to change. He ain't going to change at all. Um, she said, this, th this is what he does. She said, you're not the first. You're not going to be the last. She said, he did it to me. She was very, very encouraging because she was just like, you do not blame yourself. 
She said, you know, we both ignored red flags, um, but it is not your fault. She said, this is on him. And so we, you know, once again, I thanked her for her time, got off the phone. I took the long way home that night. Um, I, I could not be around him. <laughs> I could not be around him. I had to figure something out. I had to, I had to figure some things out. So I just, I, I took the long way home. What does that mean? It means that I purposely, I probably could have taken, oh, 75 to 285, but I probably took 20 to 75 to 285 to 675 kind of thing. Like I just took the long way home. Um, a couple of days later, because I really, my, my mind was spinning. A couple of days later, at this point, I'm turning into the FBI, CIA, and Homeland Security all in one. Literally. I'm I'm trying to find everything. Um, and he's carrying on his business as usual. Nothing changed with him. He had no idea that I had spoken to the ex-wife. He had no idea I had gone to the court and saw his divorce um, documents. He had no idea. So a couple of days later, I decided to look up his mother's obituary. Look up the mother's obituary. And um, down at the bottom where it talks about, oh, she's preceded in death by, and it lists all the people, the family members that died before. And then it says, leaving behind to cherish her memory. It lists the husband, his dad. Her husband, excuse me. Let me start over. It lists her husband, which is Legion's dad. It lists Legion's brother that lives in Philly and his wife. Because again, this is a 2000. She passed away in 2015. So it lists Legion, the, the brother in Philly and his wife and daughter, her granddaughter. It lists Legion and his wife. I think it was like Latoya. Or le, le something, le something. Um, it did not list the ex-wife I just spoke to, and it clearly said Legion, his wife Latoya. Then it listed the brother in Nashville, his wife Jane, or whatever. <sighs> So I'm thinking to myself, there's two things I was thinking immediately. Number one, um, who is LaToya? Never heard that name before. Never heard that name before. So I was thinking, who was LaToya? And then number two, where are the two sisters? Shantae and Kim. Shantae lives in Douglasville, married with two kids. Kim lives in Augusta, and I believe he told me she worked at like Procter and Gamble. So wh why aren't they listed on here? Because apparently, uh, go back to the video. I, I posted it on there. I gave y'all background on the family. He apparently was one of five through both parents, brother in Philly, older brother, younger brother in Nashville, an older sister in Douglasville, and a baby sister in Augusta. So why is it on his mother's obituary? There's only three, three children named. Where are the where are the two sisters? So I'm even more like, what in the hell is going on? And then I started thinking to myself, where? Why wouldn't they list Shantae? Like, they talk all the time, so I know that they're close because he talks to Shantae all the time. So. I, I really was confused. Again, keep in mind, I'm trying to give y'all insight into how I was thinking May of 20, uh, excuse me, May of 2021, because I still, still didn't find out a lot of stuff at that time. I found out enough to figure out, okay, it's not a question of if he's lying. That, that, that was over. It's not a question of if he's lying. The question now is becoming, what else is he lying about? So we have the phone call with the ex-wife. 
Now I see an obituary that apparently there's another wife. I know on our marriage certificate, it only states he had a pr- one previous marriage. I had zero, he had one. So this is how I'm thinking in my head, which is, okay, what am I, what am I missing here? I know we've established that he's lying, but who who the fuck is Latoya? Like, I'm really trying to understand who is Latoya. Um, and again, he's he's hobbling around the house, limping, and I'm I'm in our bed, well, in the bedroom, just. I mean, I could not get on Google fast enough to try to figure some stuff out. So, um, see the mom's obituary, study it. And at this point, I'm now trying to figure out, okay, what's the game plan? What is the game plan? And that's where we are about to get into the next part. Okay, part 30 of who the fuck did I marry? So I'm going to use this as a clarification video. So we're going to use part 30 as a stop. Let's clarify some things. Um, I've done that before on a previous set of videos. So I think it's just important to do that. So that way I can try to address some of the things that I have seen in the comments, um, both supportive and just downright mean (laughs) but let me clarify some stuff number one it is important to remember that i am telling this entire story of how i met dated married and divorced my pathologically lying ex-husband i am going in chronological order of events so what that means is that ma'am sir whoever you are if you were coming in at part 30 but you have not seen part 11, some stuff is not gonna make sense. I know, I know, I know it is a long playlist. Um, And don't worry about watching the video as soon as it comes out because everything I'm trying to do this um, responsibly of telling the story in the order of which things happen. So I say that to say, please, if if you're able to, Start at the introduction disclaimer video, start with part one, and then just watch each video. Because a lot of the questions people are having that I'm seeing in the comments, and I say this respectfully, is just because you did not go to the other videos and watch them in order. That's just the first thing I wanna say. Um, It is important that I get this story out, but that it's done, like I said, responsibly. To me, responsibly is being honest, even if it makes me look bad, but then also trying to be clear and not ramble all over the place. So I'm trying to take the time to tell you, this is what happened at this time. This is what happened at that time. That's why there's so many parts and we're not even to the part of the divorce yet. We're almost there, but we're not there yet. Second thing I wanna clarify, I cannot stress this enough. My family and my friends, did not know what was going on between Legion and I. They did not know. My family only knew we've met this guy. He's dating our daughter, our niece, our cousin, our granddaughter. He seems to be a really nice guy. He seems to really love her. Um, From what he has told us, he's done well for himself. He played football um, and he has worked at this company six, seven years and financially he is in a good place from what we understand he just moved here from california that is what they knew they did not know about the red flags i had they did not know what was going on in my head they did not know what was going on in my heart because i did not want to look stupid i'm fully aware that when i tell this story i look stupid I'm aware and I've made my peace with that. But at the time, I did not want to look stupid. So it was important to me to put on a everything's great. We're really happy. We're looking for a house and everything's going well, knowing full well that behind scenes, I couldn't figure out why he wasn't showing proof of funds. They did not know. 
So I say that to say, I see the comments about how my aunt gave me horrible advice when I called her about the sexting on Facebook. And I want to clarify something. She did not tell me to stay with him. She did not tell me to leave him. That's not her place. And that's not what she would do. She simply was in shock that any of this had happened and did not know what to give me advice on. The one thing that she did say was, look, he's not your boyfriend. Meaning it ain't as simple as, oh, we just gonna break up, pack your shit and go. Cause you married him. Ma is the most ride or die chick I've ever met. You fuck with me, you fuck with her. And she is straight Jersey. So I, and I, I love her for it, but I need it to, it's not fair for me to leave it out there as if, oh, she just was like her. I mean, go home and deal with it. No, never in a million years. So I just want to, I want to clarify that. Also want to clarify about my mom. So my mom lives in Arkansas. And when she came to visit in April, this is, we were already married. This is her first time physically meeting Legion. My mom will tell you, she had no idea anything was amiss, but there was something that nagged her a little bit. She didn't know what it was. And my mom is the type where she's gonna get on her knees in prayer. That's who she is. So for her, it was like, I don't know what it is. He seems like a nice guy. He seems to love my daughter. Um, there, Because again, there was no arguing in the house. The house was peaceful while she was here. Even though behind the scenes, we had just came off of the whole sexting incident with other women. So for her, it was like, I don't know what it is. She did tell me later on that it seemed as if I wasn't as happy as she thought I would have been. But again, she took it to the Lord in prayer and her prayer was, God, protect my child. I don't know what's going on, but protect her. That was my mom's response. So she did not know. She did not pick up um, or overhear something that was going on while she was while she was here. She had a conver uh, candid conversation with Legion and Legion kind of came across as it's. I miss my mom. I'm, he missed his own mother. And so he called my mom, mom and um, doted on her again, putting on a, sh a charade. And so for her, it was like, you know, bless his heart. That's <laughs> that's what she said. Bless his heart. Um, but no, she did. She did not know the specifics. Nobody knew the specifics. They didn't know the specifics until. We're talking May, June of 2021. They knew that we were looking for a house. They knew that the house fell through. They did not know about the proof of funds. They did not know that he wouldn't show me the savings account, the offshore account. So I just want to say that because to me, it would be irresponsible to not clarify what family and friends knew. Um, because they these people have always been supportive of me, always had my back. I just simply did not share with them the things that I felt like were red flags. Because again, my mindset at the time was I want to be married. And what if he isn't lying? And, you know, I was making excuses for him to myself. So I definitely would have made excuses to family. Another thing I need to clarify. And I saw the comments on this about how a VP would never date someone that looked like me. And to the person that wrote it, that wasn't very nice. Um, I need to, I need you all to understand the relationship started in March of 2020. He had came, he came into my life as regional manager. Okay. That is how he came into my life. Then eventually he got promoted to VP of production or operations, some VP of something. That was later on in the relationship. He showed me the paperwork where it it was basically a memo from HR. You know, you've now your new position title will be VP of 
pr production. We'll just say production. Your salary, I don't remember the exact amount because it was a very specific amount, but it was over $200,000. It listed some of the benefits that he would have. Um, he would have an office. He would be getting an executive assistant. That's where we get David from. If you don't know who David is, please go back and watch the series in order. He would be getting an executive assistant. He would be getting use of the company helicopter. He would be getting a company car. That is where we're introduced to the fact that he was starting to shop for a company car that could not be more than $90,000. That's what he told me. I didn't see this in the memo, the amount of the car, but that's what he told me. So that's where you get the car shopping for the Range Rover, the Jaguar, the um, uh, the B the BMW. He even test drove a Mercedes uh, GLE, I believe. So I'm, I'm just trying to, again, bring some clarity to this so that way we all can understand what's going on. And hopefully this just makes a lot more sense for everyone. All right. Part 31. That was part one of who the fuck did I marry? I will have part two on the way. Make sure you like, comment down below what you think about all of this and subscribe to the channel. You want to turn on the notification bell so that you can be right on time for part two later on this afternoon. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.